Let's have a day. It is trade deadline season. Does it feel real now? Does it feel it feels real? real. It feels the deals real. were going down yesterday a little bit. We were texting back and forth. The excitement was going a little bit. I felt like uh, I felt like you. Felt like me? Yeah. All over. Like, let's go. This is exciting now. You're, I'm you're not playing. Socials? Now I can look up things left and right and figure things out. Yeah, for sure. It's fun. Todd Father here, Locaine here. Kratzy, it's fun to cover when you don't have to move. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're not the you're not the one waiting for a tap on the shoulder. You're not the one that's like, oh, that was my best friend. It's okay. Why did they trade him? I wanted him to stay. Yeah, hello. No, no, you know, hugs and it's all good, man. You're gonna have a good time in your next spot. Yeah, you know. Um, hey, trading is trade getting traded is tough, but hey, on to better things. Um a lot of a lot of big deals happening over the past few days, so I'm excited to get this thing started. Ken Rosenthal is going to join us any wait. moment. Yes. Sorry. Locaine, what do you know about getting traded, man? He got you traded just... once. Zach Ranky deal. I got traded. You were, in, you were way down in the bushes, man. That was just like going to another city. You ain't getting no. You ain't getting <laughs> traded. You don't know oh. about that. You just console the dude that gets fired because they traded for Cueto and Zobris. Dudes get fired, and Locaine's like, hey, hey, enjoy Omaha. All right, my legs are tired. <laughs> i'm done i got nothing to say with that chris <laughs> ken's gonna join us in a moment uh we'll have a special segment with former big leaguer jeff fry who doesn't like celebrations and social media is mad about it um we'll get into it don't worry and then lance lynn probably his last conversation with if you want to call us the media um as a chicago white Sox player as he's on the trade block he's gonna get dealt he's a free agent after this year aj casabell will join us in the second hour uh he covers the padres on a daily basis for mlb and the padres potentially could have the two biggest trade chips suddenly which would be a pretty big deal blake snell and josh Hader? Are you kidding me so we'll see we'll keep an eye on that um and we will start with the i would say double breaking news from yesterday because first, things took over when Tom Verducci came out and said, the Angels aren't trading Otani and they're going to add. Let's charge the damn mound about it. Now, he's not the first person that threw that out there. Ken, who we'll talk to in just a moment, also has been saying that pretty much the entire time. Like, Ken's going, I don't know if that would be me, but I don't see Otani getting moved. Now, step two, Todd Father, Lucas Giolito joined the party. Reynaldo Lopez joined the party. And they give up essentially their top two prospects for a team that doesn't have much of a farm system. Guess what? There's no tomorrow. Because after this year, <laughs> if Otani's not back, they're probably in a big-ass rebuild mode for your boy Trout because they don't have a ton of great prospects. These two dudes are their top two players in the minor leagues right now. They're both gone. A catcher, I get it. They have one already. Um, and then a pitcher who's had his ups and downs, but they're both super young and they're in double A. And here we go. Does this put them over the top? Are they a playoff team now? Not necessarily, no. <laughs> I, I don't think they are right now just with those trades. I think it's exciting for Anaheim to see. All right, everybody's like, oh, they got to make a move. Well, I personally, I thought they should have traded Otani, man. I, you know, not even necessarily saying, because I always said bring him to the East Coast because I want to see him play more. They are missing out on one of the biggest trade opportunities in this lifetime of getting a plethora. And I mean a plethora of people back, whether it's draft picks, whether it's top prospects, whomever. I, I, don't, I don't think this is what they should have done. I don't think this is going to get them over the hump to win a World Series. Are they going to do more things? I mean, maybe. I think you have to now since you started, but... Eric, for me, I, I I don't know. I'm in between. I I thought they should have. I thought they should have got a bunch of stuff back for Otani. No, they're not going to do it. They're not going to trade him, which I'm fully all in for now. Before I was like, trade that man, get all that haul. Now I love what they did. Get rid of it. What you, you're not you're not rebuilding with Edgar next year. You're not rebuilding with Kai next year. You know you have two guys. One guy, Edgar's 20 years old as 
catching position in double A. He took a little, he took a little slow, you know, a little step back. He had 15, 17 pumps last year in high A. He's still three years away from being an impact player in the big leagues. Kai Bush, tall lefty, struggles with command. Get it. Get rid of them. Play <laughs> okay. for this year. You that's have all they're the guy. playing for. That's yeah, it. that's all they're playing for. And Ken wrote about it too. And Ken Rosenthal joins us right now on FT Live, right at the top here, Ken. So let's get your thoughts right away on the Angels definitely doubling down on no, not trading Otani, letting the world know, and then trading away essentially their two best prospects that are in the minor leagues right now. Well, to me, if they were going to trade Otani, Scott, they should have done it a year ago. And that was the time, and that was when you could have gotten basically the equivalent of the Juan Soto trade that the Padres made with the Nationals. That kind of return that went back to Washington. This year, he's the all-time rental. Yes, I get it, but he's still a rental, and I don't know that the value would have been what you would have determined as reasonable for a player of that caliber. So... I understood what they did with regard to not trading him. I never thought they were going to trade him. Artie Moreno, their owner, never seemed comfortable trading him. We've been talking about this for weeks, and I've been saying that pretty consistently. At the same time, when a team goes for it like this, it's a little bit like, whoa, <laughs> hold on. And I understand they might as well go for it. You're trying to get to the playoffs for the first time since 2014 in perhaps your last chance with both Otani and Trout. You're trying to make an impression on Otani with the hope of possibly re-signing him. If you trade him, you're cutting the cord. That's almost always what happens with free agents who get traded. So I do get it from the Angels' perspective. Do I think it will work? I have my doubts. Hey, Ken. So what I was just saying before, this trade to me doesn't – it's not going to make them win the World Series for one. I, I don't think so. I think they're going to have to do a couple more things. Now, do you for one, do you see them tra doing more trades now since this piece has fallen? And two, I, I, I just didn't – I thought they should have traded them. I thought this was a big opportunity for them to get a big kickback. You know, would Trout been mad? Of course. But at the same time, the players they probably could have got back in the draft picks as well would have been – unbelievable to me but I, I don't I just I still don't see them as a World Series team it's not about getting to the playoffs it's about winning the World Series at the end of the day no for the Yankees and for the Dodgers and for other teams it's about winning the World Series for the Angels at this point when you have not been to the World Series I mean the playoffs since 2014 getting to the playoffs would be really good and especially if it somehow manifests in a better opportunity to sign Otani and to keep him they're not ruling that out. They believe it's still possible, and they believe that with the course that they've taken, going back to the offseason, we've talked about this, guys, when they made a lot of moves in the offseason to get better. Then during the season, they promoted three players from their 2022 draft just this season. Then they traded for Eduardo Escobar and Mike Moustaka. So they have been on this path toward trying to get to the playoffs. That's why trading Otani would have been inconsistent, especially when they're this close right now. Now, is it a great chance? No, it's something like 16% according to fan graphs. But if you're the Angels and you've got this guy, a historic player who could do historic things this season, it's really difficult to trade him. And that's why, Todd, it was just never really going to be at their forefront unless they totally collapsed. And even then, I don't know that they wanted to do it. Yeah, and I want to clarify. I meant prospects. I know some people, I get I get trolled out there. I meant prospects. Okay, thank not you. Picks, yeah. Not picks. Not picks. <laughs> I get excited. You know how I get. Yeah. No, it's all good, man. <laughs> Todd's, in, Todd's in fantasy football season a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, is this, is this more the Angels ruining the market by overvaluing other people? Or is the market being ruined by teams who undervalue what, what it takes to get players? First of all, Eric, I never look at it like <clears> – <throat> one team ruining the market. If one team is willing to pay, that's their decision, and the other teams are just going to have to deal with it. And if it's ruined for them, well, too bad. Maybe you should have made that deal and done it preemptively. But certainly, the price they paid was high. Now, I think it was you, Eric, who made a really good point. The Angels' second and third prospects might not be other teams' second and third prospects, but they still were their number two and three prospects, and they traded them not for two guys who were stars. 
Lucas Giolito, Ronaldo Lopez, these are capable major league pitchers, but they're merely capable. I don't know that they're much above that. Giolito maybe, and Lopez maybe too. But let's face it, they're not going to all-star games and doing monstrous things. And they're rentals. So you're trading a potential future catcher and a six foot six left-hander who admittedly has had injury problems this year for two months of Giolito and two months of Reynaldo Lopez. If you get there, I don't think anyone cares. And maybe the prospects never make it. We see this all the time, guys. At the same time, the way the game operates right now, the way general managers approach trades, the way teams in general function, this kind of deal is an aberration. It is a high price for a rental, but the Angels, again, are in an extremely unique position, really an unprecedented position in the sports history. When you have a player like this, and you've only got him for two more months potentially, and you want to make sure you take your best shot with him and then perhaps keep him, that's a little bit different than most of the teams are dealing with. I give them credit for being aggressive at the same time. If, say, Blake Snell and Josh Hader suddenly become available, I would have given up my top five prospects if I'm the Angels. I think they would have made a larger impact for them down the stretch and in a playoff run potentially for them. So do you think that they're capable of doing anything else? Because I'm looking from a farm system perspective, and I'm like, you're going to lose out on most trade offers at this point. That's That's step one. Step two, part two of this question for me is, do you think that in their casual conversations, they were like, we're not going to make a trade that is going to like blow up the sport in terms of how many prospects we're going to bring back. So it's not going to look incredible for us. Let's just go for it. And it's a sign of what, say, teams like the Rays and the Orioles are going to do. They have this discipline meter where they're like, we're not going over it no matter what, even if we think the move could win us a World Series. Well, a couple things. One, part of their rationale, from what I understand, is they feared that Blake Snell and Josh Hader would not become available, that Marcus Stroman might not become available with the Cubs on this little bit of a surge here. So they felt that in order to get the pitchers that they wanted or pitchers that they wanted, they had to jump. And that's why with nearly a week before the deadline, they acted in the way that they did. Now, in terms of what they could have gotten back, Scott, it would not have been the same as what it would have been last year. And could it have been two top 100 prospects and maybe a third player, maybe a major leaguer at some level? I assume it could have been. It is Shohei Otani, and for the chance to get him, teams would have moved mountains, so to speak. But at the same time, it's, it's what we just described in reverse. You're trading for prospects, and you've got Otani. And you're Arnie Marino, and you get all this money from Japanese advertisements and merchandise and all these things that you have because you have Otani. You want to play this thing out. And that is the approach that they took. And again, I don't really have much of a fault with them or for doing what they did, this particular deadline. The last deadline, if you really were thinking long-term about your franchise and long-term stability and healthy your franchise, that is when you should have done it. They didn't do it then. And at that point, okay, they're in on Otani, and they're in on keeping him, and they're going to do what they have to do, which is exactly how they've proceeded since. What's going on, Ken? How you doing hey, Lorenzo, today? how's it going, man? Been all right, been all right. Uh, me, personally, I agree with everything. This ain't the Zach Greinke trade, by the way. <laughs> Zach Greinke for Lorenzo Cain. <laughs> I like it. Um, me, personally, I agree with everything you just said. Um, like I said, they traded for rentals. Um, to me, Shohei Otani, I think they should have traded him at the deadline. But, hey, um, they're making a move. They're trying to win a World Series. But me personally, I don't think they have a chance of, of making the playoffs or winning the World Series. So do we go into the offseason um, knowing that Otani's not coming back? And also, do you decide to move Trout now? Well, Is it an opportunity to, to move Trout and not waste his good years or the rest of the years he has left? It's funny you ask that because mm -hmm. I wrote this today. Their chances of making the playoffs are slim. Their chances of signing Otani are probably even slimmer. So yeah. if you play this out, where are they in December, for instance, if they haven't made the playoffs and Otani has gone to wherever else he might go? 
then you have some hard things to look at. And yeah, you might want to retool. Now, Artie Moreno has never really done that. They've never gone all the way down. But you have to ask yourself that question. And part of the calculus here is, okay, you're taking the shot. It looks really cool to all of us right now. But what's the downside? What's the risk? And our writer, Sam Blum, wrote about this today, that it looks rosy if it all works out. But there's a better chance it doesn't work out. And if it doesn't work out, then you're going to have to face all the questions that we're discussing here, and including the one, Lorenzo, that you just raised. What do you do with Mike Trout? Does Mike Trout at that point, who has been a good soldier throughout his career, say, you know what, guys? I, know, I want to win. I want to go to a place where I can win. It's a very good question. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm going to switch gears real quick. I'm going to uh, Thor, my guy. I play with the Mets. Um what was what was the thinking there for the Guardians there, uh, as well as the Dodgers? I, I'm I'm just I was kind of confused a little bit. Um, who won that trade? What do you, what do you think the thinking was at the end of the day for both parties? Well, it's funny, Todd. We sit here, a lot of us as reporters and others, we speculate on what trades might happen and who might fit here, who might fit there. And as I've often said, we don't know what the heck is going on, and what happens ultimately makes our heads spin around. The Giolito trade to the Angels, no one saw that coming. Syndergaard for Rosario? No, that was not on anybody's bingo card either. Now, the way I see it, the Guardians certainly need innings in their rotation. They've had injuries. Bieber, most prominent among them. They're pitching a number of kids. They're hoping Syndergaard is healthy and can give them at least some coverage for the rest of the season. Rosario was a guy that meant an awful lot to that team last season and before and even this year. But they have a number of young shortstops that they want to create opportunities for. And Rosario is a potential free agent. They weren't going to re-sign him. They did discuss an extension with him in spring training, but it didn't go very far. So that is why the Guardians did what they did. Kind of an expendable piece at a time when they needed pitching and they figured, we well, might as well take a shot. And if this is all we can get for Ahmad, Ros- Ahmad Rosario, then let's do it. The Dodgers, it's interesting there too. Because they just traded for Enrique Hernandez. Now, you're not going to play Enrique Hernandez at shortstop. We saw that happen with the Red Sox this year. And on a regular basis, it just wasn't working. Maybe even on an irregular basis, it wouldn't have worked after all that he went through there. They've got Miguel Rojas, a competent defender. Rosario hits left-handed pitching. And that's something that appeals to them. They did want right-handed bats. And while his defense this year is down, I assume they feel that he can handle the position and... They'll figure it out, a rotation with him and Rojas, and they'll play Kike against left-handers too in certain other positions. They have a unique way of putting a team together, and it usually works, right? So that was their idea. And the other thing from the Dodgers' perspective, they traded a guy that probably was never going to pitch for them again to get Ahmed Rosario, who will at least play some role. So we're talking about a team that's four games out. Yes, they have Shohei. Is it true? Are we hearing that the Diamondbacks may pivot and maybe not be real big buyers or sellers at the break with their half a game out of the wild card right now? No, it's not true that they're going to pivot. And the only thing that I've written and that is probably true is they, at the start of the month, had a lead in that division. I believe it was three games. They don't have that lead anymore. They're chasing the Dodgers as they often have throughout the past couple of, well, the past decade. And at that point, do you act as aggressively? Because you're looking at the difference between a division title and a potential buy out of the first round and a wild card, which is an entry into that first two of three. So you might not be quite as aggressive. Now, this is a team that, like many others this year, wants to get back to the postseason and is finally on the upswing. But... You're going to hear this over and over again in the next few days. We're going to act responsibly. We're not going to do anything stupid. Okay. But I can see the logic for the Diamondbacks because if you're not playing for the big prize, knocking down the Dodgers, getting that bye, you're playing for a wild card, it's a little bit of a different equation. And they could react to that. They're going to try. They're going to try to get better. But I don't know that they're going to be as aggressive as they might have been before. 
Okay, Ken, let's finish with the Cubs. And I loved your little note in the athletic windup, the great newsletter this morning about the lines <laughs> in the game. Yesterday I was watching and I was like, oh no, poor GMs are going to get calls now. They're going to be like, oh, I watched that game last night. Stroman, seven earned and three and a third. Lynn, I think some of that was uh, inherited runners after he left because I, I turned away for a moment, but seven earned and four and two thirds. He's going to join us later, later. And Joe Kelly and Middleton for the White Sox as well. Okay, so let's focus on the Cubs. We know the White Sox are going to trade everybody, but basically cease. They have made a run. They have won what now? Six of se- seven of eight. Now, Stroman's not pitching well, and he has the player opt out that, hey, if he really doesn't pitch well the next couple months, teams are definitely going to be afraid of on the other end. Bellinger looks like he'd be the best bat available. Do we really think the Cubs are going to be a serious playoff team and they're going to buy now instead of selling away Bellinger where they can get probably two high-end prospects for him? I don't know. Now, Scott, remember, they've sold the past two deadlines and they play in Chicago, a big market. It's sort of time for them to start thinking about winning, wouldn't you say? So that's one end of it. The other end of it is, most of their top prospects were guys that they acquired in those last two deadlines, those deals that they made for Bryant and Rizzo and others. So there is a real appeal to selling for them, particularly because you say it correctly, they're not going to win the World Series this year. They might not even win the NL Central this year. Probably won't, in fact. And wild card is equally elusive, most likely. So I see the logic both ways here, but I will say this. If they go into Monday or Tuesday having won, I don't know, it's 7 of 8 right now, let's say it's 10 of 12 or something along those lines, it would be really difficult to tell your players and your manager and your coaching staff, sorry guys, we're going to pull the plug right now. When we've pulled the plug the last two years, well, this is the last time we're going to do it. We might not do it again, but we might. It's problematic. And it's interesting with Stroman. His last six starts, he has regressed. Bellinger, yes, could get a lot, and you do well for him. But it's the whole question of do you go in or do you go out or do you try to kind of thread the needle in between. I'm not sure where they are right now. There isn't much clarity in in a lot of ways, but if they don't keep this going, then I think it becomes clear in yourself. Yep. Yeah, it, it's wild at this point of the year when you're looking at some of these teams. Like, I really don't see it. You're watching 100 plus games of like the Angels, the Cubs. You're like, I don't see it, but they're winning at the right time to kind of screw over their right. future, maybe to an extent. Ken, great to have you on here right at the top. Keep doing your thing. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Ken Rosenthal, and you can catch obviously everything he's doing on Twitter. He'll have fresh fair territory coming up for you next week. We'll post all of this to the podcast if you missed any of it as well. All right, so let's hit our poll question. Which of these starting pitchers would you be most excited to acquire? Guys that are on the market right now. Lance Lynn, Marcus Stroman, Jack Flaherty, Jordan Montgomery, or Michael Lorenzen. You can see on Stadium when you're watching right now either that QR code or watchstadium.com slash foul territory. If you want to vote, let us know. We'll give you our picks a little bit later on. We'll come back and we will have a little fun with some bad blood between the Rangers and the Astros. There's a lot of juice in that series. We'll talk more trades later on too. Foul territory, just getting going, baby. I was going to ask Ken what his last hey, text was. Yankee fans are complaining <laughs> about that. Brian Cashman's been there for an eternity. They've yes, made the playoffs. Yeah. They've made Every a lot year. of playoffs. <laughs> well, yeah, they haven't won a lot they, of World Series. Didn't you just say it's just about pissed. making the playoffs? For a you team, did. You did. different, different. You did. For those teams that I was talking about. If you're in a position to make the postseason, what I think is you need to go for it. You cannot, even though it ended up working out really nicely for the Orioles last year, getting a guy like Cano, last year what they did to me was unacceptable. Same with the Brewers. You're in enough of a playoff position. If you don't want to go crazy and buy your face off and you think that the prices are too high prospect-wise, okay. But selling when you're a fringe team to me is wrong because we've seen – teams that don't look incredible end up making a run the Phillies last year the Nationals in 2019 won the damn World Series just saying you got to be careful what you say so even if he's here yeah I hear you if I'm wrong I'm I know I I take fault I take fault every team every team has to just make the playoffs I think some teams that are better have an opportunity to 
sit here and go, oh, well, we don't have to, we don't have to rush Rodon back because we're going to make the playoffs. The Reds, they might be sitting in a different spot where they have to rush people back to make the playoffs. It's only about making the playoffs and how do you set yourself up to be in the playoffs. Nobody's sitting there going, oh, man, I hope we don't play the Braves in the first round. Because you're not just trying to win the first round. you got to get in. You're trying to win the whole thing. Yes. So what makes your team better? And to me, the whole Cashman, I'm fully on board with the Cashman philosophy. And now back to foul territory. We're back, baby. FT live on stadium. And we're going to do a lot of trade talk, obviously, over the next few days. But there was one game that very much stood out last night. Hot corner, baby. The Rangers-Astros rivalry is back. I feel like last night really solidified that it is very much back. Jordan Alvarez is back for the Astros, one of the most clutch clutch hitters in the game. Mm -hmm. Bregman homers. Next batter, Jordan. Yeah, we're sizzling, baby. 0-2 pitch, he's plunked. Then later on, Simeon in the third inning, he's plunked. Both of them hit on the shoulder. There was a lot of this back and forth going on later where Simeon was John at Framber Valdez. And then Adolis Garcia hits a grand slam. And there's more back and forth. And eventually when Adolis touches home, him and Maldi and Simeon are getting into it. Simeon tossed. Maldonado tossed. Now, remember, we talked yesterday about Manny Machado getting hit by a pitch from Perdomo on the Pirates. Mm-hmm. Perdomo got suspended for three games, and we're like, where's the bad blood, the past, the history, whatever? It felt like, felt like just a pissed-off pitcher. This one's got history to it, so let me just set this up, and then set we'll, it up. Set it we'll up. lay it all out, okay? So last year, there was a little back and forth with Maldonado and Adolis. Mm. So we'll show you the tweets here, and I'll read it out for you. It wasn't just the homers. As he rounded the bases and touched home plate, his first homer of the multi-homer game. Maldonado had a few words for Adolis Garcia. At the time, Garcia preferred not to comment, saying it was something he would keep between the two of them. He recalled that moment in the clubhouse. This week, this week, Adolis let it out. He goes, Maldi just kind of told me that I wasn't going to hit off of them anymore. (laughs) Garcia said through his interpreter, quote, like that would be the last home run I would hit. It kind of pushed me, gave me a little bit of inspiration to say, you know what, we'll see, let's find out. So that's kind of given that push for me to do better against them. And then he hit a home run the next at bat that day and many after that. And one more quote here because we're not going to play the whole Simeon post game chat, but he was very open about the conversations. Yep. And he basically <clears throat> said that Mald- like he- Simeon said, hey, Rangers are going to win this game like early when it was close. And then Maldonado was like, no, it's just like when you were in Oakland. <laughs> Woo! You love it. Yeah, that was a great game. I, I, no, I thought it was great. I think the banter is just a little crazy. I, I mean, I know Maldonado a little bit. I understand what he does. He, you know, he's he's gonna have his players back, but I mean, you're gonna talk about Oakland. I mean, come on, dude. I, I don't know. That, that's just, <laughs> I don't know if he knew what to say there. And, uh, listen, Simeon did the right thing, man. Got plunk, hit the home run, stared at him a little bit, did what he had to do. If you're gonna talk smack and back it up like that, I loved every second of that. If you're gonna talk it, and walk it at the same time, you know, God bless you. And listen, if you want to come, if Maldonado wants to say something after that, I, I thought that was a little cheap. Well, Dusty said after the game, Dusty Baker, Astro Skipper, quote, when you draw at the guy you expect to get something in return, Maldi wasn't going to go away like he was some little punk. So they both are going back and forth. I will say, Locaine, this started yesterday with Jordan Alvarez, their best hitter, making his return, 0-2 pitch, he's hit on the shoulder. Like, if I'm the Astros, I do understand them getting pissed off on that one. Yeah, 100%. You know, I, I definitely enjoy a little trash talk every now and then myself. So, uh, you know, I, I know Maldi as well, and he he's definitely a, the guy that kind of gets under your skin a little bit. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy it. You know, you get plunk. No one likes it. But, um, like I said, I'm, I was always a guy that I would like to back it up with my play on the field. You know, I didn't talk much, but I would love to back up everything I did on the field. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of fun to watch for sure. Yeah, I think this is part of what makes – Maldonado, everybody can – you know, you can learn to, like, call the right pitches, but he's not talking smack to their number eight hitter. He's talking smack to dudes that he's got to get under their skin a little bit mm-hmm. to get them off their game. Like, how many times are you, like, do your anger swings actually become homers? Mm-hmm. I like I like it. You, you got you to gotta talk the talk. 
you got to be able to really get under the hitter's skin and make them think, oh, well, what are they going to do next? Just like you got to be able to throw up and in on guys, and you have to be able to protect your team. So the emotions are running high. Also, I think the Rangers, I think Simeon kind of is stepping up in that role. He's very seldom, you know, he's usually just real mid with his emotions. He does not, he doesn't get too heated. He doesn't get too excited, but he saw Jonah Heim go out. He saw Seeger go out. DeGrom's been out for a while. Evaldi's, Evaldi's going down and all of a sudden, or not going down, he's, you know, he's getting, he's missing a start. His team's kind of physically falling apart. And when you get guys thrown at, and then all of a sudden, you know, the emotions start going a little higher, need it. I love seeing it from both sides. Kratzy, he jumped on the plate. That is so un Marcus <laughs> Simeon like, and I love it. He was like, dude, it's on. I'm on a good team now. I want this rivalry. I don't like my guys getting thrown at, even though yours got thrown at. Cause there was also, uh, who was it? Um, I think it was low. Who no. got, yep. Yeah, it was ri- that, that was dicey. Now Framber did not have it. He, you know, sometimes he says like mentally, it just doesn't click for him and his controls off. That was one of those games yesterday. He got smacked around, but at the same time, I think it was good, clean fun. You know what pisses me off? Top father that they got booted. They didn't throw punches. Yeah, they were just kind of looking at each other. I, Let them freaking play. And I was just going to say, it was great that they gave warnings after both guys got hit. And I thought that was solid. Usually that guy gets thrown out of the game. Now the warnings come. Both of them got hit. I respect that because usually they're taught now. Like if you throw at somebody after somebody said you get thrown out, that's not baseball. Okay. Somebody should get, you know, whether it's retaliation or something, one, one pitch, I, I would, that's old school in me, but nowadays I respect it. And then you throw guys out that that's just dumb. It's just so dumb. Let the, nobody threw a punch. They're talking smack. That's baseball. That's life in general. Okay. But yes, love the banter. I love the talking smack. I love it. Get under somebody's skin, throw a bow tie up there. Let them know you're still there. You got to keep them off balance, man. This is baseball. This is why the sport is so much fun to watch. So what happens next? Like, Kratzy, if you're catching the next matchup between these two, is there anything or you feel like they both kind of got their words in? Unless someone gets hit, right? Like, kind of unintentionally. But it's not like you're going to your boy, like, all right, now we got to get him back again. Uh, that's re- that's really, you know, you got to feel the situation. You got to be on the field and understand, you know, are we even? Did we not get even? You talk to Mal- Maldonado and he's like, yeah, I was, I was kind of chirping at him so that was that was on me you know it backfired <laughs> it backfired this time so that i don't know but i'm going to give credit to the umpires here because that pitch to low underneath his chin Oof. they could have they could have just thrown him out and i felt like they had they had good feel there that that was not an intent per pitch right there that pitch was it ran way far yes it's 97 yes it's by his face but they didn't have to throw Framber out. Dusty threw him out because he brought in a new pitcher. But <laughs> it was one of those things. I feel like normally we don't give those guys enough credit. They had good feel in that situation, which I think escalated stuff a little bit. Like why, you know, the Rangers are like, well, you know, we, na- we have no recourse now. And what I'm doing the first pitch of the next game, I'm calling a fastball inside, depending on who the pitcher is. But majority of pitchers, if there's warnings out before the game, you've got to throw the first pitch inside. Or else the rest of the game, they're, when you need to go in, they're going to be scared to go in. And that ball's going to leak over the plate, and it's going to be Souvenir City. <laughs> Low Kane, I know you said you like to have your play kind of dictate how you were going to go about your business. Mm-hmm. But that's how Marcus Semyon is. So would you have done what he did there? Because I agree. I don't remember if it was Todd or Kratzy said – the Rangers, like, they were falling in some games. Now the Astros have their best hitters coming back. They've got some injuries going on. I, I don't know. Like, you tell me, if you're on a team like this, does it help? Like, the guys are a little fired up. They feel like they can kind of go head-to-head with the Astros now. And, wait, also, side note, the score. It was 3 nothing. Breg- Breggy bomb early on in the game in the first inning. You're like, uh-oh, here comes Houston. Todd Father and me were that like, yesterday. we both picked that game. And then 13 mm. unanswered runs by the Rangers. Yeah. Well, I, for, first and foremost, I love seeing that for Marcus Simeon. You know, just playing against him over the years. You know, he just seemed like a, you know, humble guy. He stays to himself. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that I didn't talk when, when we, you know, the scuffles happen on the field. Now, I'm backing my teammates 100%. And that's why I love to see that from Simeon. 
And uh, yeah, as a whole, you want to see that from your teammates. That's to me, that's a sign of a good team, you know, backing each other um, all the time. So um, just overall, it was a good situation to see as a whole. And then for them to go out and put up the amount of runs they did after the altercations, that was that was definitely a lot of fun. I'm with you, baby. I think yeah. that was good. Yeah. Well, I I love seeing this stuff, especially this time of year, because mm -hmm. You know these two teams are in the middle of the, in the thick of it too as well. Oh. So, go ahead, man. You want to pop off a little bit, chirp yeah. a little bit. Let's go, man. And to back it up even better, it's like ah, ooh, maybe I shouldn't. You know, but so it's like it makes it makes for exciting times, makes for exciting baseball. Now when these guys face each other again, people are like all right, this must be TV. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100%. when we do game time, I'm I'm getting my ticket to Arlington or to Houston hmm. to watch that game. I'll tell you that. We'll swing back. Uh, we will go over still to come. Obviously, all of your trade questions. Our number two is going to have Lance Lynn and AJ Casabell is going to talk Padres with us. Is to go over our baseballer viral hit, which includes some celebrating. Questionable? Straight to it. I love that. Yeah. You just showed me. Yeah, they were pissed. At, and enough's enough. Just go straight to the Don. Yes, yeah, straight to the Don. We got a, we got a problem, don't we, this from guy, the weekend? Uh, Zach, Zach Campbell, man. I'm starting to learn about this guy a little bit more. I didn't know much about him until he's wearing the umpire cap out there. You know, I, Listen, the problem is he's pushing people around to get these balls. Like, listen, if that, if that was me, like, I would probably have to take, take the ball out of his hand. Watch this. Devers hits the home run. This guy has been known for catching all these. He's got thousands of balls. Look at him. Shoves the guy out of the way, jumping for joy. Like, oh, man, I just won the lottery shoving it in everybody's face he, he shoved that guy to get the ball shoved him and the woman behind was like what like think about it. you buy Come a on. ticket you buy a ticket in right field down the right field line whatever it is you're like could you imagine if i get a home run ball my favorite player is rafael devers yeah just signed a 313 and a half million dollar deal i could get a foul ball I could get a homer. Get out of my way. And this dude comes in Come on, straight dunking on people. It's <laughs> so crazy to catch a home run ball. Absolutely. It's it's awesome how he knows where to be, how he treats and how he does it, how he treats people. Yeah. I read a story about a dude, a kid, a kid in Colorado that dropped a ball that he caught in BP. And the kid dropped it and he took it. And, oh, yeah. and, went, and kept it. Yep. And when was asked about it, they were like, why didn't you give that ball back? He goes, because it's my ball now. He dropped it. So he's playing villain? Is he like the type? I, I, oh, he's, he's definitely a troll. Well, because no I've doubt. heard that. No I, I used no, to no hear doubt. in the past that he would give a lot of the baseballs out. I don't know, Zach. To charity things, he does like, you know. But not to fans? Like, I mean, you catch a billion baseballs. Even if, if I get a baseball, I'm, I mean, unless it's Judge's home run ball, I'm giving it out to a kid. No, he caught he, he caught a rods. He caught well. Those he are the caught funny the three thousand hit the, by the Devers homer right there. That's a flip to a kid, and I'll, I'll I'll take you down one notch. You're like, hey, I go to a game, I pay for those seats. I want to hit. A, I want to catch a home run ball. Like that would be a thrill. How about I just don't want to get elbowed in the face and lose a tooth. And now back to foul territory. We're back. Uh, poll results, and we'll get an answer from everyone here. Who do you think is the most attractive of these trade deadline starters that you'd want on your team? Throw a name out there for us. Todd Father, who do you like? I'm going Lance Lynn just because I've played with him, and I know the energy he brings and the veteran leadership. Big game guy. Big game Striking guy. guys out. Yeah, he had a rough, rough one yesterday. He's going to talk to us later. But, yeah, I like that one. Stroman's winning here. Lorenzen's close. I voted for Lorenzen. He looks good right now. He looks, to me – Kratzy, yeah, he's not a one, but he looks reliable. Like, I know what I'm getting with him right now. That is exactly it. What are you getting? You're not 100% sure. The ceiling might not be as high, but I feel like the floor, and he's and he's been in the bullpen before. If something happens, he can be a piece for your playoff bullpen. I get it. You're not going to spend as much as you are on Giolito or Lynn or anything like that, but I, I, I have Lorenzen as just the most even Steven guy up there. Kalo, who you got? Wow, that's kind of who I went with as well, Kratz. Everything you just said. Um, yeah, I don't think you have to spend a lot to get him. Um, and and like you, he can be a starter, he can be a bullpen guy, he can come in whenever. And he's always been a consistent guy out of the bullpen. So uh, yeah, I mean he's he's been a lot of fun to watch. And he can also, hit a dinger too. I was yeah, gonna say 
dude can <laughs> dude can swing the bat. Seriously. I mean, if you need someone, I know he hasn't really done it this year, but poor I poor man I, Shohei. Very poor man Shohei. Yeah. <laughs> he might be good for a few. Maybe, maybe if he was more full time, what, 10 homers for a season. What about is he good 60. for a few brawls as well or what? A few what? Men? A few brawls as well. He looks oh, like a strong guy. Hell yeah. Oh, he looks <laughs> yeah. like Scooter over here. Nah, he's got a lot on me, and and he claims he hasn't done bicep curls yeah. since he was a kid or something, <laughs> yeah. and that he's gonna do it after. He's going to like, those I'm not sure. Push ups, I'm not sure. Hey, right, total well, package, well, then. Well, let's get into some social media muscles right now. Time for our baseballer viral hit of the week, and this one certainly went off across all of the socials on Twitter, and and then carried over to baseballer's Instagram. Here's Jeff Fry saying, thanks MLB for encouraging kids to act foolishly on a baseball field. I'm sure this young man has a bright future, but I played against his dad. It was a great hitter, and I never saw him do this. That's Manny Ramirez. And that, on with us right now, is Jeff Fry, former big leaguer, current agent, eight years in the bigs. Jeff, great to have you on. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I appreciate you guys having me on here today. All right. Yeah, absolutely, dude. And I know you've been catching a lot of heat, and you've had some people that have agreed with you, too. So why don't you explain your side of the story and why you think a clip like that from Manny Ramirez's kid, in your mind, is too much? Well, I think a lot of it's too much. And it's uh, in my mind, it's been uh, kind of pushed by Major League Baseball with their Let the Kids Play initiative and it's trickled down now to the amateur levels and all the way down into little league. And it's, uh, you know, I've always encourage uh, parents to make sure their kids are having fun playing baseball because I know I had so much fun playing and it was never pushed down my throat. And so I encourage them to make sure their kids are having fun. Uh, but I do believe there's a, a certain level of respect that we should teach the kids. And it seems to me in my mind that Major League Baseball is pushing this initiative because the game became boring because of the analytics and you know the 3-2 outcomes so now we have to attract a younger audience and the only way to do it because the younger audience is so into social media is make it exciting and doing silly stuff and dancing and throwing bats and that's just uh, I'm an older guy so I just not the way I was raised. I, I, I'm with you too I understand I'm, I'm the same kind of person too when I came up and now I'm coaching my nine-year-old son in baseball as well. Are, and you're coaching too, I assume, or no? No, my boys are older, man. I coached them okay. in the league, but they're at, you know, I coached them for the entire entire time. They were, you know, from like six or seven years old to coach pitch up through uh, uh, junior high and stuff. And then once uh, I realized that uh, they didn't think I knew what I was talking about, <laughs> I, I just kind of pushed them off and, and uh, you know, let their, their coaches coach them. So my, my biggest thing is, so – Travel ball has changed totally, and as you can see, I mean, you, you see what's going on right now. It's, it's a lot of craziness. I'm enjoying it. Don't get me wrong. I do see 9-year-olds. I see 10-year-olds. They're pimping home runs left and right. For me now, now the new guy seeing this new generation, I'm not necessarily upset about the fact about it. It's just something that is going on right now. Do I think they need to respect the game a little more? Of course. But how? my question to you, how would you do that for a young kid and explain to them that's not the way when you could tell them over and over and they're still probably going to do it. Yeah, that's a problem, Todd, is, is that, uh, you know, when I was growing up playing Little League and stuff like that, I watched Major League Baseball all the time. And I was, uh, you know, emulate what I see the guys on TV doing. Those were my heroes. And now the, the young kids are seeing what their heroes are doing on TV. And, you know, it's the, the fake selfies and they go in the dugout and they jump in a a basket and they push them through there and they throw sunflower seeds or they spit water out of their mouth and to me it's it's you know it's kind of like frat boy behavior and as long as everybody's having fun and goofing off it's okay and i think that's probably where the that's the root of the problem and i love little kids having fun i, I go talk to kids all the time man i just did a camp went to georgia and i did a two-day tryout uh, for joey hamilton my old teammates uh, organization you might know joey from the reds but uh you know, we just had such a great time and the kids were having fun. And, and I talked to the parents on the side about keeping it fun for the kids. But I also think that these kids should have some accountability and, and you know, learn the, to play the game because they love the game, not because of the other stuff that seems like everybody's being attracted to. So I'm going to be a fan right here on social media. You put that post up. My question underneath, just pretend I'm some, some just random baseball fan. 
why does this bother you so much? Like, why, why do you even care anymore since you don't play anymore? You know, if I'm a fan right now asking that question. Uh, it's not really that it bothers me so much. It's just that I think that we need to teach kids, um, you know, about respect. And I, I just, I see, I, I see a lot of kids. I spend a lot of time around kids. My, my sons are in their 20s. I spend a lot of time around kids. My, my sons are in their 20s. Uh, but I see a lot of the younger generation seems like they don't have respect for anybody or themselves. And, you know, I do a lot of work with a couple of retired army colonels who are all about respect and accountability and the greatest teams on earth are in our special forces and these guys work for these guys and it's all about deflecting credit um, accepting um, criticism and everything is about the team and everything i see now is about the individual would you rather see because you love baseball i can hear it i can see it in your posts you see it in your career you have to choose one of the two and we're not about sitting on the fence here. Would you rather see kids celebrate or baseball die if those are the only two choices? Yeah, I, obviously I don't want baseball to die, so I would have to defer to seeing kids celebrate. Um, you know, it's, uh, I know Eric, I, I know a little bit about all you guys. Uh, I know um, you guys all played in the big leagues a long time, and I know that uh, when we came up, we kind of had the veteran presence in the locker room that would set us straight about the things we we were allowed to do and we didn't really question it and it's just kind of the way it was and you know if some young guy came up and was uh, as usually happened some maybe first round draft pick or a younger kid who came up and and seemed like he was a little uh over excitable and, and flipping his bat or showboating that uh, a veteran would grab him and say listen that you're either going to get hurt or one of your teammates is going to get hurt by doing that so stop it and, and just play the game like you're supposed to be played. Um, yeah, quick question. Quick question from me. Um, you know, I agree. I agree with some of the, some of the things you said because I'm big on respect as well. But, you know, I have three little boys myself, and they all see, like I say, Tatis. They see th those are the, the, the players they name and guys like that, the flipping bats and, you know, jumping up and down and doing all that. I think personally that it's it's the game. It's they have to bring that fun, that energy to the game to to enjoy it for more. Um, I think baseball has been kind of stagnant for a little bit, and I think that excitement and that fun that kids are showing now, you know, it is starting to draw more people towards the game. So, if like I say, what would you tell your kids that's modeling guys, like you say, like a Tatis and all the young players that's coming up that's doing the bat flips and the jumping and all the other stuff they uh, do in the dugout? Well, that, that's a great question. Just uh, and, and, you know, when my kids were young, they didn't have this, this social media stuff. So uh -huh. it's a different world. I understand that completely. And so I can't honestly tell you exactly how I would handle it. I would just say that, you know, that the kid on the other team that's pitching, you know, he, he's pretty disappointed probably because you just hit a home run off him and he already feels bad enough. So just put yourself in his shoes and think how you're going to feel if it's, you give up a home run and somebody acts that way when you're pitching. All right, so where is the line? What is the line? Is it is it Don Mattingly, the post <laughs> that you just posted? Or is it Lucas Ramirez on a walk-off homer for his travel team doing it just the same way his dad used to pimp stuff in the fifth, sixth inning of games. Yeah, I don't know what the line is, Eric. And, and you know, in the tweet, I know everybody ran with the tweet. Who'd have thought it would, it would turn into something like this? Uh, never my intention. Um, but, you know, what is the line? Obviously, we all saw Manny Ramirez pimp home runs. I mean, he was one of the best right-handed hitters I'd ever seen uh, when he came up to the big leagues with the Indians. And, you know, I think the thing that people miss is that I never said I didn't see Manny Ramirez celebrate home runs. But I never saw Manny Ramirez stop 15 feet before home plate and dance all the way in. And that's something that I've seen now quite a few times where it's like a, it's like the, uh, the college kids, you know, or high school kids. Every time a kid hits a home run, then the whole team comes to home plate and starts dancing around. And, you know, that's what I said. So the tweet, you know, that went viral or whatever, um, never said that I never saw Manny Ramirez celebrate. So... Jeff, to help us out here on the celebration front, yeah, like tell us, g give us more though on on where you think 
it's okay and not okay for the sport. You know, for young players especially who want to have a little more fun and show their personality. Like, if I hit a walk-off home run, can I do my thing when I'm rounding home plate? You know, can I have, like, a little signature thing I do with the third base coach when I'm rounding? Can I do a little stutter step? Like, to me, we see, hey, we see a ton of that going on in the NFL. The guys celebrate after they do something big. They did a lot to get to that point. And you could say the same thing about a kid who's working hard every day. It's not like, in my mind, he's not hurting anyone's feelings. Like, if I'm the pitcher and I give up that homer and you're, you're pissed off that somebody took an extra millisecond to celebrate something, I'm like, who cares? Pitch better. And then when you strike a dude out, you can pump your fist and go nuts and scream at the guy and do whatever, you know, from the mound, which we've seen for years, too. Yeah, I think we saw that two days ago with the Pirates when – when Soto uh, kind of stood and stared at it, uh, his home run and then Manny Machado was hit the next pitch. So not everybody uh, is willing to accept it. I guess if, uh, you know, the, the pitcher you hit the home run off of doesn't mind you pimping it that, and you don't mind him fist pumping or pounding his chest or screaming some obscenities at you, I guess it's cool. Uh, you know, to me, the whole, maybe the worst thing is the, uh, you know, the, the stuff's going on in the dugouts with the costumes and stuff. And it, to me, it would just, I can't even imagine what my teammates would have done back in the day. Nolan Ryan and, and some Roger Clemens, if, if, you know, we put a cape on a guy after he did his job and a helmet on him like a Viking. And, and, you know, he ran through the dugout and we threw sunflower seeds at him. They would have said, what are you idiots doing? <laughs> I know it's different. I just, it's just, yeah, yeah I'm trying to it's warm up. It's different, bro. That, that's it, why I, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I think it's fun, man. I think it's an absolute, it's pretty cool for baseball. You got guys getting swords dressed up after a home run. I know it's different, but I think it's, it's making the game a lot better, man. And I, you know, from your standpoint, I get it the old school way, but it's, it's totally, it totally changed the game in the better. But wait, yeah, Jeff, you did say in the one tweet, I played against his dad who was a great hitter and I never saw him do this. I didn't see him. So I didn't see him dance. I didn't say I saw him. Oh, you didn't see him dance, whatever. Jeff. You got to be specific on socials, <laughs> or they'll get after you. Apparently. I'm Apparently. telling you, man. We yeah, do I a show just... every day for hours. We, if we don't clarify, the place goes off. So that's that's why I'm glad to bring you on, though. Okay. So it's specifically on the dancing. That's fine. That's that's I think what you need to tell the world. Well, I left that up for people's interpretation, and obviously they ran with it and said, <laughs> yeah. and said "Of course you did." And then said that, uh, you know, they started posting stuff about Manny Ramirez and uh, pimping homers and stuff like that. And, and I understand it's different. If you hit a walk-off home run to win the game, that's a different situation than hitting a, a solo home run when your team's losing 9-2 to two and stopping before first base and taking a fake selfie. To me, that's about you, and it's not about the team because your team's losing the game. Fair. All right, good. I'm glad we talked this out, man. That's why we need words instead of social sometimes. <laughs> Jeff, great to have you on. Appreciate it. We'll have you on again when we have more time. All right. I appreciate it, fellas. Y'all have a great day. Cheers, man. You, you too. too. Have a good one. Jeff Fry, former big Thanks. leaguer, agent, the whole deal. And you can see more on that clip, too, on Baseballer. And Baseballer's got the merch running. Uh, Kratzy's wearing the shirt. It's fire. Baseballer. Dot com. We'll swing back on stadium and finish up on stadium and get us ready for a big ass hour number two on FT Live. All for you, that or oh, yeah. skin mark in Kingpin. Yeah, that's yeah, you know that's bullshit right there. You bring that up. What do you mean? No. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, yeah, so so let me I'll do a quick one on that that one. Uh, so um, uh, I was supposed to be in Dumb and Dumber, and the team wouldn't let me go. We we're gonna film one day somewhere. And Wait, were you gonna be Sea Bass? I was gonna be Sea Bass, kick Damn. his ass, Sea Bass. Yeah. So and the Fairley brothers, they they love to have like a New England, uh, you know, uh, athlete or whatever in their movies. So I said, listen, they're not gonna let me come. I'm kind of disappointed. It looked like it was gonna be fun. But Cam Neely, Cam was with the Bruins at the time, and I uh, said, get Cam. So Cam had kind of a Canadian accent, and most of the lines in there for like a shit-kicking truck driver. You know, I'm going to kick his ass, sea bass, and all that. So they go, we're going to get you. We're going to get you. So you just stay tight. So the following winter, they called, and they said, all right, we got a roll for you. It's in the off season. We're filming in Reno. We're flying you in there. 
take one day, we're filming at night, and you can do it. And I said, I'm not going anywhere, boys, till you tell me. I know you guys got a crazy nickname. What's my name in the movie? And they go, well, if we tell you that, you won't come. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what is it? And he goes, well, you're skid mark. And I go, you guys are freaking crazy. <laughs> and I said, they go, all right. I said, what, do you, what am I going to be this time? They go, you're going to be another shit kicking truck driver. You're going to come into a bar and Randy Quaid's going to be dancing with your girl. And that's where Woody's going to be with you, Harrelson. And here we go. And, uh, but yeah, they, I, I, the hat I had on, I had an earring in. I had three tattoos of the girls that I had dated or married, and they crossed two of them out, and I had the current one on my on my <laughs> bicep. And then uh, my hat my hat was the best. My hat said uh, truck driver hat said ass, grass, or cash. No one rides for free. <laughs> I love it. I love it. He's with the Phillies. I've I've gotten to meet a lot of those guys. Uh, I was teasing uh, Bryce Harper that when he was 14, he climbed my fence here in Houston to jump inside and hit my indoor facility. And uh, when he was just a youngster, but uh, those guys are great. They've taken him in. He's he's been sent down. Hopefully, he'll get the call back up because he can play both corner positions. And now back to foul territory. We're back on stadium for another minute. Hour number two. Lance Lynn's going to talk to us. He's probably going to get traded over the next few days, if not the next few hours. AJ Casabell covers the Padres on a daily basis. We'll go over San Diego, and we'll also start the next hour. A bunch of trade stuff. What'd you think of Jeff Fry just now? I mean, we only got like 30 seconds, then we'll flip it over to Yeah, him. I liked it. I just I just wanted to make sure he understood the game's different now. So he doesn't, yeah. you know, people can dance, they can sing, they can do whatever they want. I think it's exciting for baseball. And I just want to get that point across to him so we understood this ain't this ain't the 80s and 90s anymore. So it's a different game. Jump on board or keep being cranky, I guess. I also thought <laughs> Kratz that he clarified. He basically said he's cool with everything except for like dancing and taking some time before hitting home plate. Like, I no, I thought he backtracked a little bit on what he was saying. Oh, he definitely backtracked. But if me and Locaine are playing wiffle ball, we can't go and get our ball off his yard if it goes into his yard. <laughs> like, you know, come on, man. All good. Hey, uh, you know me. I want it all. I don't even think we do even close to enough. I mean, watch a sack in the NFL right now. They let him do whatever the hell they want for the next 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and I'm all about it, so – Good stuff. We got a lot to cover trade deadline wise. Hour number two on FT's YouTube channel. Flip over. FT Live, hour number two. Lance Lynn joining us soon from the Chicago White Sox for now. Uh, Eric Kratz at one point, and then we'll run the return for the White Sox in this Angels trade with Otani. Yeah, the dancing still Something's going. Something's going on over Kratz, there. you put, what did you say, three and a half is the over-under for how many White Sox are going to get traded? You might want to up that to like six and a half. <laughs> Especially with Ozzie Guillen saying the guys that work in the parking lot are getting traded. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have that clip. We'll get to it. So Kyle Glazer from Baseball America gives us the goods on the prospect return for the White Sox in this deal with Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez moving over to the Angels. And the Angels saying, uh, don't touch our Shohei Otani. 
In exchange for Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez, the White Sox got two promising young prospects in AA who project to be a part of their team moving forward in catcher Edgar Caro and left-handed pitcher Kai Bush from the Angels. Caro is a 20-year-old switch hitting catcher, a very advanced hitter for his age, strong hands, innate feel for the barrel, should grow into power as he gets stronger. His defense needs a little bit of work. He tends to try and pick balls out of the dirt as opposed to get his body in front and block them. His footwork and transfer need to improve as does his arm accuracy on throws down to second base. But you still have the foundation here of a switch hitting bat first catcher who should be able to play every day. Bush is a six foot six left-hander with a four pitch mix topped by a 92, 95 mile an hour fastball with good sink, as well as a swing and miss slider. He has the foundation to be a back of the rotation left-hander, someone who should help the White Sox moving forward. They're still young players. Development is still ahead, but if everything clicks, Bush should end up being a part of the White Sox rotation, and Caro should be their everyday catcher for years to come. So that's a pretty good return wow. for the White Sox. And it's it's like he was saying with Kai Bush, they're not necessarily seeing him as a top-end guy, and Caro's not necessarily going to be you know the world's best catcher, but two serviceable big leaguers, if you're projecting them at this point, that you'll have team control of. That's great, but also tells me, the Angels farm system, I think most places have them ranked bottom like three. And now they're an easy 30th in most people's book. Like they've got nothing going for the future. And I know Eric's going to agree with me on this. They're prospects right now. So to hear that, oh, for days to come, you hear a guy say that, Glazer, I love him to death. You know, I know guys, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more of the old school. I want guys that have been there before. So we don't know what we're going to get with any of these guys. Minor leagues are totally different than the major leagues. So for me, I want guys that have been there before that have done it. Eric, I know you're going to agree with me on that one. No, I completely disagree with you. What? Oh, of course I agree with you. <laughs> like, like let, let's just – let's put into perspective what the word prospect means. There is nothing – they have not accomplished anything. This guy, this catcher – listen to what Glazer said. He said – he doesn't have, you know, he could he could grow into power. Okay, well, he's probably wrong on that because he had 17 homers last year. So he's already <laughs> grown into his power. Or wait, is it is it, you know, is it gone now because he only has three homers this year? Like prospect stuff just you could write the same article about the number 30 prospect in an organization. And unfortunately for the Angels, they didn't have much of a prospect, you know system so their top guy is more like a 10 in other organizations you just you're not talking about a Marcelo Meyer you're not talking about a Jackson Holiday or a Juan Soto when he was coming up or an Ellie De La Cruz here we're talking about a kid who is 20 and he's catching which is the most difficult position to come up to the big leagues in by far and you're talking about the fact that now he's going to the White Sox system. Who have the White Sox ever produced that they're like, besides first round picks? It's like, well, you're you're pretty much good enough to play. Who have they been producing that hasn't been a high pick and was like, oh, they're just going to make the big leagues anyway? I'm going to disagree with you, but we don't have time for it right now. I think Kara's going to be at least an average dude. He's already got more walks than strikeouts. He's young. He's in double A. We'll get to it. Let's, let's table it because actually – we have a dude with the White Sox right now joining us on FT Live. It's Charlotte's Web Player Access, sponsored by Recreate, connecting us with our dude, Lance Lynn. What's going on, Lance? How's life right now? Give us the play-by-play. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a little hectic. We might be packing. So that's where we're at. <laughs> hey, time out. Where, where are you going, kid? Are you leaving hey, already? I, I don't know where I'm going. I just heard that I might be going, so we're getting ahead of it um, just so – uh, you know, when you have four kids, you gotta you gotta kind of stay ahead of things and be prepared. <laughs> like right, like as in packing today. Are you getting like minute by minute updates? Like it might go down today because we were getting these rumors flying around yesterday. We were like, is he gonna make his start? Did you know if you were gonna make your start? Uh, every at all uh, at all times yesterday, I was making my start. But there were moments where I was like, man, am I about to get tapped on the shoulder saying, hey, uh, somebody else just got it tonight? That was that was uh you know, a lot of that going around. So, you know, it's part of the business this time of year, especially when uh, you underperform as a team. Unfortunately, uh, guys, friends, and teammates get, get sent off to other places. And, you know, we saw that last night after the game with, with Lopi and Gio. 
Is this kind of like a, an exciting time for you? I, I feel like around this time when you know basically you're going to get traded, like there's something you get a little renowned energy a little bit. You're talking to the family like, oh, I might go here, I might go there. It's kind of got to be a little exciting for you. Yeah, I mean, you start looking at the teams that are, are you know, interested. You're like, man, I'm going to have a chance to, uh, you know, make a run at something this year. Um, you know, obviously it hadn't been the best of years uh, for me personally and or the team here in Chicago. But when you got a chance to, uh, you know, kind of regroup, uh, take a deep breath and make a run at, at, at a championship, it uh, definitely gives you a little, little pep in your step. What does the house look like when you're packing up four kids, possibly not knowing exactly where you're going? What does it look like? I uh, mean, we got boxes of toys that are that are going in the car, getting shipped. We got boxes of toys that are getting shipped home. We've got, you know how it is. It's like, uh, what's the most important thing, and make sure you you bring it because if you don't have it, then someone's gonna someone's gonna go crazy when they're when they're looking for, uh, you know, the baby that you left behind or something like that. So uh, we <laughs> make sure we got uh, wraps on the things that we really need and our, our go tos, and and those are what's coming with us. And are they taking? Are they taking? You know, the trip with you? Are they all going with you, or is it like, ah, eh, depends? If you go to Tampa, we're not big. You know, we're we're not big in the sun, kind of thing. Yeah, you know how it is. You know how uh, the families are like, ah, oh, this place would be nicer than the next place. So, um, you know, you kind of have an idea where, uh, you know, what each stop's been. Heck, I played in every stadium, so I know all the cities and stuff like that. I think the big thing's good to be. Making sure you can get a house that uh, you know can everybody can be comfortable within first before everybody comes. But the idea is to make sure everybody goes, everybody gets to experience it because you don't know how long you're gonna do this thing. Okay, Lance, take us through the list portion of this. So the the teams are out there: Tampa Bay Angels, Blue Jays, Cardinals, Dodgers, Giants, Mariners, Mets, Padres, Yankees on your ten team no trade list. How does that get assembled? And then how do the conversations go about if you would say yes or no to particular teams? Like, I want I want a car. I want better. You know, I want a suite. I want the whole deal. If you're, if you're bringing me over, right? Like, that's your right in your contract. Yeah. I think uh, the, the original uh, list, uh, there was no really rhyme or reason for it. Uh, we were just going over teams. And, you know, you kind of have an idea. You know, you're not going to get traded to any of the central teams um, just because of you know, interdivision trades are usually not happening. So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. Uh, you know, there's teams that are probably not going to be out of it. So the original thought was picking teams that I thought had a good chance of being in things um, and things like that. So you could have a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe maybe say, hey, what's that option look like? What's another year look like? Stuff like that. Just so you can have those conversations um, to see what they think about you, where, where they're headed, stuff like that before you okay a, a place to go. But you're in a boat now where you just want a chance to win down the stretch here. Um, and you'll worry about next year, next year. So, uh, you know, there's been no, uh, personal or no calls to me asking me if I would lift, um, uh, my no trade to any certain team. So the, you know, everything with me is if the team's got a chance to win, uh, give me a call and we'll talk about it. What's going on, Lance? How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How about yourself? All right. All right, man. I know why you had the Yanks on the list. You know, you got the beard going. It's looking nice. <laughs> you know, I understand that. But with all the uncertainty, man, is it – I hate to put you on the spot. Is it? Is there one team that you would like to go to knowing that basically you're going to get traded? One of your favorites. Uh, to be I honest to with you, you I've got four teams, and they're, they're, they're all supposedly in on me. So I'm not mad. I'm not <laughs> mad at the four that are in on me right now. So um, as of – for me personally, I think I'm, I'm in a uh, – you know, in a good spot to where I might land um, to, you know, I think the, of the teams that are, that are interested, every one of them are in first place. So uh, there's some people out there that still think I can get it done. Um, I know I can get it done. I'm just uh, looking forward to an, a, a chance to make a run and, and have a little uh, different uh, perspective here down the stretch. Nice. Okay. What are the four teams? <laughs> Need them. Uh, what did they say in yesterday? The Rays, uh, yep. the Dodgers came out, Rangers came out. And then, uh, shoot, who was the fourth team last night? Uh, crap. There's been uh, – what's the fourth team? The Brewers. <laughs> no. I've not heard the Brewers one time. Tor but. I mean, is it a team that was on the list? Like, is it a Toronto or – No, uh, there's no team on the list. So, that's why, maybe that's why it didn't really pop in my head because there's one that uh, I had no choice to go to even if they even if they pulled the trigger. It's, hey, here you go. Enjoy your flight. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and almost every team needs pitching. I'm trying to think of who else. Philadelphia. You guys, you guys getting on a PJ so you get there quick and everybody everybody gets there at the same time, depending on where it's at? Oh, yeah. My girls love to fly uh, private. They, they don't like commercial <laughs> at all. And to be honest with you, we love to fly private, too, so they don't have to worry about commercial. We might get ourselves kicked off a commercial flight with 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 my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Epic. Hey, all right. So right now you're waiting, but Lucas and Reynaldo are the first two to go. So that goes down yesterday. Take us through, you know, what you saw from those two when it happened. And also, do you have one of these where there's this like package deal? Must be in Lucas's contract where he gets dealt wherever Reynaldo gets dealt because that Adam Eaton deal from years <laughs> back they both went in the same trade there too. Yeah, so it's kind of a it was kind of a weird way it went down last night. It was after the game, um, Lopi gets called in first. I think Geo showering or eating or something, and you know everyone tells him congrats, you know, good luck, all you know, best of all that stuff. And then Lucas comes and gives him a hug. He's like, man, we've always been teammates. I'm going to miss you. And then they tapped Lucas on the shoulder. And I was like, you guys aren't done yet. It looks like. So it was kind of a, uh, kind of a weird little moment for him. Cause he thought Lopi was gone. He's like, man, we've always been teammates, uh, in same organization, you know, who knows, you know, I'm going to miss you. And then next thing you know, they're going together. So we just told him, Hey, you guys are going to be best friends for life. So you might as well just get used <laughs> to it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously whenever someone gets traded and you say your goodbyes, it's, it's never a good feeling. Cause, you know how it is. If you're getting traded and guys are going places, you underperformed. There's really no other way to put it. And, you know, you wish everybody the best and all that. But as of right now, we, we underperformed as a team and, and we're getting uh, dismantled because of that. Were you surprised the Angels, though, were the team that they're going to? Because everyone's talking about Otani. Are they going to move him? Hey, I don't know what the percentage chance is for the White Sox, obviously, at this point. Obviously, it was pretty much close to zero based on how the team's done for postseason. The Angels' percentage chance to make the playoffs is still very low, so they pick up two dudes that are your teammates, and I would think maybe they were surprised unless they heard otherwise that that was the team they were moving to. Yeah, I'm going to tell you that no one saw that place coming. Um, to be honest, you hear a lot of rumors about other places with, with Gio. Um, he was pretty much connected to every team looking for a starter is what it sounded like. Um, and then you hear the Angels, once they say we're bringing Otani back, they seem to be going for it, which you respect because you'd love to see Mike Trout and Otani in the, in the postseason somewhere. And, uh, you know, that'd be good for baseball. So, you know, hopefully they can uh, have a run and, and do their thing. And, you know, I hope the best for especially for Lucas and, and Lopi um, and, you know, get a chance to go show, you know, what they're about in another organization before they hit free agency. Hey, Lance, for the White Sox, do you feel like, the team did enough during the winning window because some fans are pissed where it's like it felt like it was coming for a little bit right and the, and you had the the postseason appearance where they didn't go as far as they wanted but kind of felt like this team could take off for a couple years and now it's back on the downturn when guys are chit-chatting about how kind of this is the end and they're breaking up the band do you feel like there was enough Brzezinski's not here your boy but he would definitely say he's like they, they've never gotten a player for a $100 million contract. You know, like, when you're in, you got to go in, baby. Yeah. I mean, you understand that, especially as a fan. Hey, when if you're supposedly going for it, let's go all in. But I think in the uh, ownership's mind and all that, uh, they have gone for it. You're looking at uh, what our salary this year is the highest it's ever been in franchise history. So you can't sit here and say that they haven't gone for it. It's just things haven't worked out, um, to be honest with you. You know, we had some health issues. That's part of the game. But, you know, there was issues with <clears throat> we just didn't come together as a team and we underperformed. There's really no other way to say it. And, you know, you can both point fingers at, at whoever you want. But sometimes 26 guys just don't come together and make a good team. And we weren't able to do that for some reason. You have an option for next year of $18 million. Does this no trade or, you know, are you getting traded? Do they come to you and say, hey, if we trade you here, would you be willing to – pick up my option or is that, is that a discussion that you've never been through or you don't know how that works? Um, yeah. So I think the, the big thing is with, with the teams that I put on it, there was, um, you know, you knew that there were uh, teams that were most likely going to win and they're going to win for a long time. So if there was the way, the waving of the no trade, you can maybe say, Hey, what's that look like about picking up my option or, or add another year and stuff like that. But 
right now where I'm at right now. I just need to go have a have a strong end of the season, no matter where I'm at, and just show everybody that I want to win and uh, I want to have a chance to play for a, a championship this year. And uh, you know all that other stuff will take care of itself now. Uh, I want to talk about Tim Anderson a little bit. He's been smacking the ball around lately, doing pretty well. It seems like he might be destined to leave too as well. Um, what are the talks about him? Has he been chatting a little bit? What's he, is he getting giddy in there a little bit or no? Uh, to be honest with you, I think you're starting to see Tim fully get healthy after his little knee issue um, that happened earlier this year. People don't realize, you know, you get to, you know how it is. You get, don't have your legs under you at the plate. There's no good. So he was trying to generate power because he knew he didn't have his legs and, he, and then he got out of it, got out of what he does best. And you're starting to see that um, his legs feel good. He's starting to hit the ball the other way again. He's been able to stay back and uh, make good contact where early on he was, you know, he was just trying to force things because he didn't have his legs under him. But, you know, Tim's a good ball player and, you know, he can do a lot of great things on the field. Um, and I know he wants to win too. And this has been eating at him all year. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with him. You haven't really heard much, but I know that he wants to win and wherever he plays, he's going to give everything he's got every day, uh, no matter what, uh, what's going on. And, uh, you know, he's starting to get healthy. So when he's healthy and doing the things that he can do, man, he's a really dynamic player. When you get to your new team and you get into the clubhouse, what's the first thing you do? You're meeting 15 new people. You're meeting the assistant <laughs> club. What's, what's the first thing you're doing? Are you killing spread right, right out of the gate or are you? Yeah, no, you you got to wait for the spread. Uh, but the first thing you do, obviously, you walk in the manager and tell him, you know, hey, I'm ready to rock. Just tell me what you need me to do and let's go do it. And then most likely, you know, it is when you get older in this game, you probably know half the clubhouse somehow, some way. So there's going to be some uh, guys that you got to catch up with and stuff like that. And then you meet your new teammates and then figure out when you're going to strap it on and go pitch that day. And, and that's where it's at. And, and then naturally, you got to get with the catchers and be like, hey, Here's what I like to do. What do you like to do? Pitching coaches and all that. And what do you guys got for me on uh, on uh, how we want to go about uh, working together here? And well, then you kill spread. Yeah, and then and you kill then, spread. And then, you know, kill spread, then maybe have a drink and get to know people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Kratzy, this was important that I learned from Kratz the other day. Spread with shirt on. Like our, all the guys on this show, they saw Sal Freelich, the rookie on the Brewers, um, it was before he got to the bigs, in fairness. He was the, the big big shot in the minors. And Lance he was can do it, though. No he could do, it without, can do it without a shirt on. He, do you, he, eat, yeah. do you eat in the clubhouse with no shirt on? No, I like to be fully clothed when I eat. I struggle with guys with no shirts or and or, you know, with other things in the spread. I don't want to say it on here. You know, I like to wear, I like to wear pants and a shirt while eating. <laughs> you don't want things hanging See, around. Lance, Lance would have got on him for that for sure. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Just like you guys all said no it, doubt, right? No doubt. No I'm doubt. with you. All right. So we got a couple fan questions. One from Drew here. What's your favorite memory on the White Sox? And what would be your message to fans about your time here? Uh, man, to be honest with you, the fans here were awesome to me. Uh, you know, the South Side of Chicago, they have, they have pride. They're not afraid to tell you how they think. And, and what they what they expect from you. So I respect that. Um, you know, I've always been a truth teller. I've always expected, uh, you know, people to tell me the truth and do what they're asking. You know, unfortunately, I you know, me personally, I haven't had the, the best year that I wanted, but I had some I had some good times here. The fans were awesome. You know, they let me be me and they supported me and I respect them for that. And, uh, you know, I wish them wish them all the best. And, uh, you know, obviously, when you make the playoffs, that's always the best times. But we obviously didn't make the run that we wanted to that year either. And then you have multiple fans asking for, you know, a look beyond the numbers. Do you think there was anything like from a chemistry perspective, fans want to know that like prevented the team from doing what they're doing? Or it just felt like the talent wasn't getting the job done. Obviously, you're not going to go on there and be like, yeah, everyone hates each other. And that's <laughs> why we didn't perform up to the expectations. You know, fans always want to know that stuff, like what's going on in the clubhouse. And obviously, it's harder for everyone to be smiling when when the team's not winning as much as they feel like they should. Yeah, I mean, you look at whenever you're on a team that's underperforming, uh, nobody's happy. Um, nobody's excited about losing games and stuff like that. So in all, in all honesty, everybody got along well. There was just one of those things where on the field, for some reason, we just couldn't ever – we haven't been able to find a rhythm, especially the last year and a half. That first year we had – a lot of a lot of positives, a lot of winning, and all that. So, when you're winning, you're able to you know build off of it um, and come together and all that. When you're losing, it's like kind of everyone kind of feels like they're on their own island because it's like, man, 
oh, is it my fault we lost today or you know is it like how can i do better myself and then you just you're just unable to kind of you know get out of your own head sometimes um but man when it's all said and done i've had some of my lifelong friends in this clubhouse um and you know how it is it doesn't matter if you win or lose you you're going to create those relationships and you know there's guys that uh you know you're going to contact forever and, and and be in touch with it's just for some reason health uh just the the way that everything worked nothing figured like got on a rhythm and you just you just sometimes you just can't explain it there's really no other way to do it and uh you know we weren't able to do that uh for whatever it may be hey are the reds on your no trade clause no the reds aren't on my no trade you know that I'm, i grew up yeah. in indianapolis i'll play for the, the red machine I think that I think that I think that's the four team. I think that's the four team. No, is it the Reds or the Orioles? I think the Reds would be a super fit for you, dude. I've got some. uh, I mean, their manager was my bench coach in St. Louis, so I've got Mm -hmm. some ties there. That's for sure. So, uh, heck, they're. I think they're bullpen coach. I played college baseball with. So, there's definitely right in with those boys. You you and Votto going to dinner. I'm getting old, man. I know everybody though. (laughs) <laughs> you and Votto going to dinner every night, especially after the interview he had the other day. You guys would be perfect for each other. I don't, man. I, there, him and I might. It might be a weird little fit. We're both it, way dry. Be, I know humor. it would be. We, we, we might be like the Bash Brothers, or we might just kind of just get after each other. Who knows? It, it was a little bit of both. That's why it would be a perfect fit. Hey, Lance, um, how is Dylan Cease doing? Because I feel like most of the dudes that we're talking about – like there's a lot of guys that are either going to be free agents or close to it, right? For the White Sox that are most likely going to get dealt still here. Like uh, I know Joe Kelly just came back, and um, uh, obviously we've talked about you and and the two dudes that went yesterday. Maybe like a Andrews Grandal. Um, Dylan Cease is interesting because he was so freaking good last year. He's had his ups and downs. We've certainly seen some of those starts where he's great. It's it's almost been. I mean, I don't want to put it right in the same light here but like uh mm-hmm. corbin burns you know where he he's had his ups and downs too but you know the talent's there and if he's on a contender he could win you a world series where do you think he's at this year from what you've seen and is he kind of checking you know his phone a little more right now too yeah no i think when obviously you don't know what's going to happen um but he's a he's in a spot where he's young cheap and controllable so i don't think he's going anywhere especially if they if they plan on uh you know, making a run at it again next year. Uh, but all in all, you look at a guy who's um, my first year in 21, he really, like, learned to start coming to his own. And then last year st- started dominating, um, had a lot of success. And then you're looking at the league kind of making an adjustment to him, and he's making that adjustment back. And that, that's part of the that's part of the pitching prospect or the pitching process throughout the years. You got to you know figure out how to be successful here, and then you got to figure out how to make the adjustment once they figure you out. And then after that, it's about execution. So I think with with all of this this year, he's had uh, sometimes where he didn't execute the way he wanted to, um, or some things weren't weren't falling his way. But all in all, man, the guy's still got great stuff. Uh, he's not having a, a terrible year. And he's really, especially as of late, throwing the ball well. He just, you know, you know, I can't buy a win. It seems like, and that's that's part of the problem sometimes when you when you when you get in these stretches when the whole team's kind of not doing uh, up to their up to their capability. Everybody kind of uh, seems to uh, you know be in a funk at the same time. It's just a it's just a weird weird way to go about things sometimes. Lance, last one from us. What do you think of the? Cardinals clubhouse right now and what they're going through because you know a lot of those guys and they came out and said just like the White Sox like it's not our year we're trading dudes away they have a lot of free agents I mean they could trade away like five to seven players over the next five days and also another team they were supposed to be really good they were picked by most to be the division winners and it just didn't work out for them and it's not like it was like an overabundance of injuries and I know you're your boy Wayno, who you like to give shit to, it, it sucks for him. I almost wish that like he could get dealt and see how he does the rest of the season because like this is it for him. He announced he's retiring. Yeah, I think that you know the reason why he came back is he was he wants those two hundred wins in a Cardinal uniform. So you just wish down down the stretch that he gets healthy enough where he has that opportunity. And you know there comes a time in every organization where you know sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, you look at the Cardinals where they you know they have the talent. Uh, you know, they have some young guys that are controllable. They've got guys that are coming up free agency. They've got a chance to, to uh, you know, regroup and, uh, like, not even – it's not even a rebuild. It's like, all right, 
we got to we're going to get rid of some of these guys, add some depth throughout the minor leagues, and then see what the off season looks like for us, so we can just retool and get back at it. Um, sometimes that happens in this game. You see, the Yankees did that years ago with when they got rid of Chapman and everybody like that, and then next thing you know, they were right back at it the next year. So I can see that out of the out of the Cardinals, uh, especially. You know, if you keep Goldschmidt and, and Arenado, and and then you you add some pitching around what they got and and do some things like that, they're going to be right back in the mix next year in the Central. All right, the PJ is a flex because the family likes it. You're going to fly into your new city on a flex. Are you getting in? Now you've had so many different numbers. Are you getting into your city depending on the team and being like, I want 33, I want 31. Uh oh. <laughs> no, so and, for me, it's going to be anything in the 30s. So that's okay. Kind of all the I've, all the 30s are 30. taken. Yeah, all the 30s, all the 30s are, are taken. Are, are taken, you going to flex? Somebody and... with less time than me will not have that jersey on their back end. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to buy them though? What are you going to get them? Hey, they ask and and they'll, they'll get it. So we'll, we'll just figure it out. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, for me, I think I've had, I've had, you know, I've been on different teams where there's only Minnesota, I had 31, I had 31 in St. Louis. But after that, I've just bounced around in the 30s. So anything in the 30s will, will, uh, will go, go to, uh, would be nice. You know, if I go back to Texas and 35 is available again, maybe I'll jump back into that. So, um, you know, it's kind of fun to have the known what jersey number you were in what city. And then just like, that's it, that's what you were there. So, if I go to a city I've never been to, it's whatever they have available in the 30s, and I'm going to hop into it, and uh, I'm going to go pitch. Kratz, are you about to join the Rangers because Jonah Heim got a little hurt and grabbed 35 for like three days? So you <laughs> can get quick. a little I'm Rolex gonna some, out of it? I'm going to get some, I'm gonna get some uh, college funds for my kid. <laughs> Lance, go. Lance will be sending my kids to college. Appreciate you, Lance. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Good stuff. Hey, yeah, I mean, I saw, I saw Lackey yeah. buy a Babe Ruth something for Pat Neshek back in the day. I was like, what is going on? So I've seen some weird that. bias, that's for sure. And then I've seen some guys who just straight up take it. <laughs> <laughs> Give them nothing. So, don't get, you don't Sorry. get a damn thing. Yeah, it's mine now. <laughs> hey, Lance, awesome to have you. You know, uh, during these times, obviously, I think fans really appreciate the insight. I mean, you guys tell me, no Kratzy, like fans ask us all the time. It's cool. Like, that's why we're doing this show. For fans and and for us, obviously, to be able to have players talk to you about like what life's like right now, but also like it's baseball, it's fun. Like this is not you know somebody going through some crazy medical situation. Like everyone's going to be fine. And you're going to have a great rest of the season with another ball club. Yeah, it's crazy, man. When I was growing up and watching you watch uh, you watch TV or whatever, and you're like, hey, this guy got traded. You're like, oh, good for him. He gets to go on another team or something like that. Now you're grown up. You're like, damn. He's got four kids. He's got to pack up everything. <laughs> He's real. He's keeping it real. It's yeah. real. It's real. Hell yeah. Hey, Kratzy, you know, tell him. What's your number? How many? How many teams? Nine How many moves? Teams, How 14 many 14 organizations. You no. know who's going to get the biggest gift? Your Who? wife. Yeah. She's yep. a oh, huge 100%. gift. Yeah. It, that's what the off season's for and trips. That's for darn sure. Oh, Hell yeah. No, that's why hey, Kratzy's on this show because he's he moved 96 times 94 96 Kratz help me 94 out. moves of 94. a month or more got, got me of a month or more Ooh, okay. he's our moving specialist he's our trade deadline specialist during this time of year so Let he can know. box he can box shit up with the best of them <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> my wife can well behind the oh. dish i could box stuff up too you know that <laughs> box up those wine bottles too Bow, you like get... you on opening day yeah get that frying pan out of there hell yeah lance appreciate you man we'll talk to you very soon all right, see y'all. All right. Good luck. Cheers. Lance Lynn with us on FT Live. Really great stuff there from Lance going over the whole deal right now with the White Sox. And a quick reminder to everyone, that was our Charlotte's Web Player Access sponsored by Recreate. Hey, if you want a chance to win a trip to the World Series, you're looking at it on your screen right now, and I'll explain it for the podcast crowd. Recreate wants to send you to the World Series. Follow hello underscore recreate on Instagram for more info. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes end July 31st. That's very soon. Must be 18 or older. For rules, visit charlottesweb.com slash world series. Recreate is the official CBD of Major League Baseball. For all the fans that are in here right now in the YouTube chat and you've got trade questions, we'll run it with you for the next 30 minutes. And we'll ask some of them to AJ Casabell, who's joining us. You know, we book guests sometimes last minute for a reason. Suddenly, I think it was this morning, Bob Nightingale pops up with a tweet and says basically that the Padres could be selling. And if they are, 
Blake Snell and Josh Hader, who immediately would go to the front of the trade conversation as maybe the top two dudes to acquire. Ooh, wow. That's pretty nice. That, I mean, that would crazy. change the complexion of the trade deadline because we lost Otani, right? He's not getting dealt. But all of a sudden, teams want this guy. And now it's like, oh, let me just talk to them first and see what's going down. Oh, watch out now. Hey, what do we think of Lance here? Like, Locaine, for you, you know, you get to talk to a guy now being on the other side. You're out of the game. And we don't get to see these conversations often. Like, you don't get it on TV. You don't get it really anywhere unless we have you guys on to, to talk through it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be hectic, you know, um, not knowing what's going to happen, the uncertainty of everything, the entire situation. But he I mean, he's a pro. You know, he's been doing it for a while. I think he'll handle this with ease. And like I say, it makes it easy when you just take a private jet and just get to where you need to be. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an easy transition for him. I think he's going to join a whatever ball club. He's going to fit right in and he's going to go out there and dominate. So I'm excited to see where he goes. I'll say this too, Kratzy. The fans that are listening right now appreciate a player for coming on like that. I've always said this, like this show can also serve a purpose where even in the beginning of the year, remember like Lance had a few rough, st rough starts right off the jump. White Sox weren't playing well. And then he comes on and he's just like, fucking suck. Mm -hmm. The fucking sweeper's not he's sweeping. <laughs> like fans appreciate just real talk. Real talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they don't, they don't get that. They get the two and a half minute placard of, you know, we had to do better as a team. We had to do this. You can't get into the fact that he's got four kids that he's got to pack up. And, yeah, he's flying on a PJ. People are going to be like, oh, yeah, I really feel bad for a guy who's making – made over $100 million in his career. That's a man – like, that is a father, a husband. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the stuff – this is the kind of, like, guest for him to come on and hopefully Kike coming on, you know, tomorrow, that kind of thing we get the insight of what it's like. Like, it is real life stuff. Lorenzo Cain, he's on the show right now. The guy was struggling in his last year, got to his 10 years, and now he's at home. Like, what does that look like? What is What do those things look like? And this show, that's what it does. And I, I'm fully on board with, with Lance coming on and being like, yeah, like these are some real things. We barely even talked about what he's going to change. You know, most shows be like, okay, well, when you get to the Raiders, you know, when you get to the Rays or the O's, what are they going to change? What pitch are they going to change? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'll try my cutter a little harder, or I'll just try to – no. We got into real stuff today, and I think it was awesome Lance coming on. Yeah, and I'll tell you this, because I did the TV thing for a while. They wouldn't even go that far. They would ask him that after he gets traded. Before he gets traded, it's like, oh, awkward, and don't want to say anything, and it, it's super weird. So it's just like, yo, let's talk like humans with Lance right now. It's great. You did the so. TV thing for a while? I did the TV oh, thing okay. for a while. I didn't know. Google me. Google me, bro. <laughs> Google me. Look at my Wikipedia, baby. Oh, uh, but we'll take your questions, especially on the Padres, since they might have the two hottest players available at the moment. I think that's pretty relevant. And, yes, uh, what Kratz said is true. Kike Hernandez just traded to the Dodgers. We had Ross Stripling, his former teammate on yesterday, reading tweet or text exchanges that he had with Kike and then saying, Watch, he joins the team. He's immediately going to be shown in the dugout twerking. What happens <clears throat> three hours later? He's in the dugout twerking, dominating social media, starting at second base for L.A. So we'll talk to Kike tomorrow about that whole experience. Corbin Burns is going to join us tomorrow. We're 1 to 3 Eastern, and we'll be at the Borgata if anyone wants to see us live uh, in Atlantic City. So we'll be there to do the show. So uh, And then we'll do trade talk, too. All right, let's get to uh, the next trade discussion right now. Charlotte's Web Player Access is sponsored by Recreate, and we're connecting with Padres beat reporter for MLB, AJ Casavell, for the first time on this show. AJ, good to see you, dude. Very timely. We, we've wanted to have you on for a bit, and this is actually the perfect day for it because we need help here. The Padres could completely swing around the trade deadline if they suddenly decide to sell and say, we're going to be top dog, and we're going to get a ton for Snell and Hater, and we're going to rebuild. Where are we at as of right now? I wish I had better answers for you because it's it's been about for a month now where we kind of weren't sure which direction they'd go, whether it was buying, whether it was selling. He kind of wanted them to – wanted the team's performance to put them in one direction or another, and they haven't. I mean, they, they lost three or four in Philadelphia, and it looked like the season was kind of on the brink, and they were going towards seller, and then they finished that road trip strong, and then they come back home, and they lose two or three to the, to the Pirates. So I think as things stand – there's a possibility for both. There's a possibility the Padres buy and sell. And 
if they take the avenue of selling and maybe last night's White Sox Angels trade kind of is sets the market for what you can get for a starter and a reliever. It's a seller's market and the Padres have two of the most intriguing chips. So I would expect with this team, nothing happens imminently. The Padres get as much data as they can on what they have. Maybe wait till after a weekend series against Texas. But if I'm, if I'm looking at the needle where it stands on the buy sell scale, I think ever so slightly it's tilted towards sell. So my question would be is, all right, they do sell. Snell, Hater, they all of a sudden, all right, they're out there to get taken. What are they trying to get back? Uh, have you heard any inkling on that? Is there some, is there anything like really specific that they're like, you know what, we're willing to give this up, but what are we, what are you trying to get back? Is it a boatload? Is it just certain person they're looking for? Talk to me. It's, it's a, they're, they're going to want a lot back because th those two guys are obviously key pieces to 2023 and they haven't given up on 2023. I think the key for what they want back is guys who can help them win either this season or very shortly, because they're going to enter 2024, regardless of how the 23 season finishes with championship aspirations. It's Juan Soto's final season before free agency. You have Manny Machado and Xander Bogart still in their primes. You got a pitching staff anchored by Joe Musgrove and you Darvish. Like this is a team that should contend next year. It should be contending this year, but that's its own story. So I think they're going to want to get pieces that help fill out their bench that are controllable. Maybe I, I think I mentioned the possibility that they both buy and sell. I think that's, a, a real possibility that they were to, if they were to trade someone like Josh Hader, they get back two or three kind of big league caliber guys to, to help their bench depth or some of maybe their outfield depth and maybe a prospect or two. And then you turn around and, and acquire a, a relief pitcher who has more control beyond this season. I think that's possible. So I think the biggest thing is in the, in, in the, what the Padres are searching for are guys that can still help them either now or very shortly because they're, they, they still think their windows open. It's just, it's just not pretty in the standings right now. All right. You said intriguing pieces in the trade market. Wouldn't you say they're the two best pieces? If they're offering Blake Snell and Josh Hader, are they not the two best pieces available right now? I think they are. I mean, as it looks like Shohei Otani's not. And so those are those are probably the two best guys. Blake Snell's been been awesome. I think he's been – I mean, it, it was kind of a travesty that he wasn't an all-star in his hometown – He's been maybe the best pitcher in baseball for almost two and a half months now. Every time he goes out there, when he's bad, it's six innings, one run, a whole bunch of walks. When he's good, it's seven shutout innings. You put that guy in, in your rotation, he can start game one of a playoff series with how well he's pitching right now. So the Padres could get a lot for that, for, for Blake Snell. Same goes for Josh Hader. He's been locked down at the back end of that bullpen. And, and it's, it, I mean, if the Padres were to look to trade those guys, I think they would still say... They want to compete in 2023, and they have a lot of talent there to do so. But those guys have been so valuable for what they're trying to accomplish this season that like, any team that gets them will instantly have two guys who, who are good pieces for the rest of the regular season, no doubt. But Blake Snell could be a game one or two starter. Josh Hader could, could save big games in the postseason. Like, those are October pieces. Okay. Just help me to understand this. Help me to understand this. The Padres are willing to sell, which I don't think they should personally. I think they should go out there because I think they have a really good team personally. But the Angels are going after it. They're, like, they're trying to make it to the playoffs and hopefully win a World Series. I'm kind of confused on that entire situation. Can you help me understand that? Because I, I feel that the Padres are the better team by far, even though it's not showing in the standings. But help me understand that situation. Why, why should the Padres be selling and the Angels shouldn't? Maybe the Padres don't sell. I mean, they, there's a case to be made that they should absolutely buy because mm -hmm. you look at kind of where they are in the standings. I don't, I don't know what we would make the, the playoff odds right now for, for the Padres, but I think it's like a one in three shot at the playoffs. But if the Padres make the playoffs, like with the roster they have, with Blake Snell, with Josh Hader, like that's a team that could do damage in October. And so maybe you look at buying. I think the argument to selling is just that this team that that on paper looks like it should be so much better than it is, and I think the Angels even are four or five games better than what the Padres are right now. Like the Padres just haven't lived up to that team all season, so they haven't shown the signs of of being that team. I think in an ideal world, they'd like another like two or three weeks to kind of see if they can attain that, but they just haven't. Something so far this season has been missing. What that thing is, I'm I watch them every day. I have a hard time putting my finger on it because they, I mean. 
Their run differential so good, they just lose every close game. It seems like. And so, I mean, if the Padres were to if the Padres were to buy at the trade deadline and add a, they wouldn't have to sacrifice too much to add a a, a DH type bat and maybe a, a middle innings reliever. That's a team that could go on a run and make the playoffs. I think you just look at the odds and you say it's more likely than not that they don't. So do you sell as a result of that? And then what happens? I think you also don't want to you don't want to you don't want to take what you have here, which is a lot of really good players, and kind of upset what's going on. Mm-hmm. This is a team that should be a contender in twenty twenty four, regardless of what happens. I I just don't know what they're going to do over the next four days, and whether they look to that as the goal or whether they still keep their focus right now in this season, even with the odds dwindling. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go back to what you're saying here because I've watched a lot of Padres, and hey, I've done well on on my bets that I've placed this year. But I did say for our preseason predictions. I love the Padres. I think they're going to win the World Series. It's not looking good right now. Now, at some point, I was like, oh, this could be like the Phillies last year where the team underperforms for a while. And then all of a sudden, they go on a run and then they get hot at the right time and they make that run through the playoffs. Still possible. Not a lot of time left and no chance in my mind, obviously, if Snell and or Hater are dealt. So I'll kind of finish that statement with a question of just what the fuck? Like, why are all of those close games not going their way? Now, is it bullpen to blame? Is it the offense for not blowing teams out at times when it feels like they should? And also, this series tells it all. You're watching them play a Pirates team that is just flat out not good. And the Pirates are, they're making the Pirates look like a playoff team. Yeah, and that, I, I don't have the answer to, to that, the close game question, but I keep writing it and I keep talking about it because that's the biggest issue. This is a team that's a lot better than what their record says it is just based on the talent they have. Their differential is plus 51. I think they're that, that's the third best in the National League and their record is the 10th best. I think they're 6-17 in one-run games, 0-9 in and and extra innings. It's Some of it's the bullpen getting overworked at certain times. Some of it's not situational hitting. I think some of it is games like yesterday where you kind of have Johan Oviedo on the ropes early and they let him off the hook and all of a sudden it gets to the seventh, eighth inning and you're like, man, where where is this game headed? Like how, how are the Padres not up by three or four runs already? And then you get to the ninth inning and all of a sudden there's pressing. There's, there's a lot of like weirdness to it. I think some of it might be luck, which is part of the reason I think that you take this roster and you run it back in 2024 with, with, Whatever else you do, like there's a good chance they could be a contender then. But I I just don't know what's been lacking from this group other than results in those close games. And so it's it, it it's hard to it's hard to figure out. They're they're so much better than than what their record indicates based on the talent they have, but they just haven't played like it. This is rumor season. You're in the clubhouse all the time. We've heard rumors about the clubhouse having an issue. Somebody being in the clubhouse that is not, you know, is the clubhouse together? And, you know, take away the losing part of it because every, everyone hates life when they're losing. But is there a clubhouse thing that you see that's going on in there? I don't I don't really think so. I think it's a pissed off team that's losing a bunch of games. And that's that's the clubhouse that I that I go into after after games. I don't think there's like discord among the players. I think there, there's plenty of unity there. But Losing greats on you and losing in, in, in this sport, probably, I mean, you guys know better than me, like losing in this sport where it's where every single day you're kind of not living up to those expectations is different than, than any other. And so being in a clubhouse day in, day out, when you're not living up to those expectations, I think it maybe feels a little bit like every time the Padres, every time the Padres win a game, maybe it's kind of what everyone in that clubhouse feels like they should be doing. So you don't appreciate it as much. You don't revel in it as much. And when you lose a game and you're four games under 500 already and you lose to the Pirates on a Wednesday afternoon in July, knowing where you are at the trade deadline, it starts to feel like a crisis. And I think that builds and compounds and frustrations grow. And so I I don't know about specific discord, but I don't think it's a happy clubhouse. All right. I got a fan question for you here from Brian. He asked, why did Padres extend players they didn't have to, like a Darvish and a Cronworth? What would you answer to that? Well, they're kind of two separate cases. Darvish was going to be a free agent after this season, and they looked at their rotation beyond this season and essentially felt that that having you, Darvish, beyond this year was going to be probably more important than... Like, they locked him up at a relatively reasonable average annual value. He has 
kind of been up and down this season. I still think you Darvish is going to be really good late into late late into his career. The Cronenworth one I think is a little kind of different question because they had so much team control left on him, and I I just think they really like the guy and they like the piece and they like the fit in the clubhouse. And uh, it, I mean his AAV is also pretty low, but that's one where you you kind of you see it and you're like, well they could have it had they waited to negotiate maybe things would have been a little different there. Um, it's it's kind of also. The, the organizational preference, the ownership preference to find guys that they, they want to build around and keep them here long term. I mean, I don't know whether that we'll, we'll kind of see what happens later in those contracts. I'm sure both of them at, toward the end of them won't look great, but there are two integral pieces that I think in Darvish's case, he's been mostly fine this season. He had a couple a couple starts that have that have kind of blown up his ERA. Um, in Cronenworth's case, he's just he just hasn't lived up to what what the Padres expected him to be till now all right your crystal ball time we don't think we don't know what the padres are this year i mean next year at this time the padres are the exact same how are the padres going to handle juan soto differently than the angels are handling otani so you're saying the padres are the exact same or as they are this year i think if they're in the same spot they are this year then something's gone terribly wrong next year because this this team as constructed can't do can't possibly do this two years in a row right so <laughs> I, I think if if it got to that point the Padres would have to consider trading Juan Soto and recouping some of that value but I just think they're going to go into that season like the re- there's a reason Juan Soto hasn't been mentioned in any trade discussions this year it's because the Padres look at 2024 and say you know what this if even if what they end up saying is 2023 probably not going to happen and they trade hater or they trade Snell or they trade them both. They still look at 2024 as a season where they can win. They can accomplish big things. And so if they're in the same spot next season, I think they would have to entertain. So the trading Soto, I just don't think they have any plans to do so because they really, really want to take this franchise where it hasn't been before, which is winning a world series. Okay. Let's finish with this. Where's AJ Preller at? I mean, obviously he's going to at least run this team through next year. If this team doesn't do what it's expected to do at some point, he's been with the ball club for a while. Do you think that he's going to feel his seat getting hot? I know and we have a ton of respect. I mean, we, we talk about owners on this show all the time. Peter Seidler has, has gone for it, picking up superstars, putting money into the team. The place is filled up and I've been out there. It's freaking awesome. Like most, we wish most owners would be like Peter Seidler. He sets the great example and he sounds like he's a loyal guy too. Do you think there's disappointment in the front office just for not being still like a consistent winner in playoff team, despite all of this, like the formula isn't connecting, which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's like, there's such a complicated kind of look at what AJ Preller has done in his tenure with the Padres because he's brought in so many big time players and big time pieces and he's done so with the backing of ownership. And then there's just kind of questions about how he's filled out the fringes of his roster. Some of which are out of his control. Some of which are completely within his control. I think the Padres one through 10, their 10 best players are better than any top 10 players on any roster in baseball. And so you kind of wonder, well, what's, what's maybe going on with those 11 through 40 that the Padres aren't living up to those expectations, that their bench is as thin as it is where when the season's on the line, you've got some of the career minor league pieces that you have batting in the ninth inning of a big game against the Pirates. So I, I think there's there's probably, like the organization, Peter Seidler, he, what he's done for San Diego has been outstanding. The ballpark's packed every single night. And the leeway he's given A.J. Preller to kind of go and acquire these superstars and then pay these superstars is, I mean, it, it's extremely notable. I think A.J. Preller... Probably, I, I don't know what happens the rest of this season, but he would probably be given the foresight to go ahead and see what happens in 2024 too with him at the helm. It'll be, if if the Padres, I mean, we're getting really ahead of ourselves here because Preller has a very big next five days first, but if, if the Padres don't realize their goals and aspirations this season, I think Preller, based on what's happened now in two of the last three seasons, 2023 was or 2022 was kind of magical in San Diego. They beat the Dodgers. They they signed or they traded for Juan Soto. But I think if you go into this offseason with two out of three seasons ending in disappointment, when the Padres have pushed more of their chips in than they had in the past, then Preller's seat will be hot going into 2024.
Hey, appreciate you coming on here, man. I know you're a Jersey guy like myself. I'm going to send you out a fresh pie because I know you're not eating good pizza over there. So be on the lookout. <laughs> it's it's decent. There's no such thing as bad pizza, but nothing like Jersey pizza. All right. I respect that, man. Thanks again for coming out. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, AJ. Great to talk to you, dude. AJ Casabell, and, and you can follow him, of course, not only on Twitter, but does a great job writing for MLB for years now on the Padres. Like, like you saw here, like real talk really gets into it. Um, at AJ Casavell, C A S S A V E L L, if you want to give him a follow. And if you're into trying to win a trip to the World Series, recreate the official CBD of MLB he wants to send you there. Follow at hello underscore recreate on IG. Post a photo in your favorite baseball gear using the hashtag live play recreate along with the hashtag RC sweepstakes. No purchase necessary. The sweepstakes ends July 31st and is open to legal residents of the 50 U.S. states and D.C. age 18 plus. For rules, visit charlottesweb.com slash World Series. Recreate the official CBD of Major League Baseball. Woo! <laughs> what a day. Chat's been bumping. I love the questions from everyone. Also, real quick, um, before we get to locks, just wanted to get thoughts on the trades we didn't cover if you had a comment so you saw the dylan floro for jorge lopez deal so lopez gets another year he's got another year of control for the marlins kind of a higher upside pick versus a floro who can help the twins this year and is more consistent change of scenery kind of deal and then also we had todd father the dodgers we talked a little bit about it with Ken Rosenthal, but picking up Ahmed Rosario, mm -hmm. who you played with or no? Yes, I did. Yep. You played with Ahmed, and he had a great year last year. He's a little more down this year. His defense rating and metrics-wise isn't good, and he's not hitting like he did last year. But maybe, again, change of scenery, him for your boy Thor. That too, was, too was a shocker play for with me. Both of them. Yeah, I – it is what it is. Can't change it now. I, I didn't – we don't you – know, some of these you don't see coming, and you don't know what they're really thinking. You know, I know – Thor told me a while back, you know, he wasn't, you know, himself. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was going on over there. He wished it was a little better. But for me, um, yeah, they're both good dudes, man. I, I, I think Ahmed needs to change scenery. I think Thor needs to change scenery. So they're both going to two good ball clubs. It's not like they're going to some, some shrimps that are not even in it. So they're going to good ball clubs. Hopefully that scenery helps both of them because they're really, really good dudes. Did the Brad. twins did the twins fleece the Marlins again on another trade? Getting Floro for I'm I'm just trolling you. Oh, <laughs> rise in Pablo Lopez. That's a win win. Even it's a win win. Rise. No, I mean you, we know how much you love a rise, but well, I think look, he's not he's not like hitting 400 right now, and look what happened to the Marlins since he's not hitting. You know, he's hitting, like he's hitting 299 in the last in 20 slump. games. Right, exactly. He's in a slump, and the Marlins can't hit. But Jorge Lopez was legit. So I think his – I said earlier about ceiling. I think Jorge Lopez's ceiling is really high. But I think Floro, with that sinker slider, keeping the ball in the ballpark in Minnesota is – it's a big thing. You watch some Minnesota games right now. The ball is flying out of target field. Yes, sir. Well, also, for me, you know, uh, Kiki, yeah, Kiki you going got? back to the – Oh, quick. Kiki going back to the, you know, the Dodgers, you know, them getting a familiar face. You know, there's definitely a comfort level uh, with him being out there. So, uh, yeah, you know how the Dodgers, they know how to put together, uh, put together a roster and uh, they find ways to go out there and get wins. So they'll be definitely a fun team to continue to watch down the stretch. Also, uh, the Cardinals don't have Paul DeYoung in the lineup today against mm -mm. the lefty. Uh -oh. So. Keep an eye on on that ball club. I mean, some of these teams have like the Cardinals have like five, six dudes to trade. So it, it's got to happen. It's got to happen soon. It, it might happen today. We might be talking about it a lot tomorrow. So mm -hmm. keep an eye out. Let's sneak in our locks real quick from uh, BetMGM backtracking to yesterday. A rare off day for us mm -hmm. lately. Clean sweep of, of L's. I so. I know once I I piggybacked you that I should not. That was on me. That's I apologize. Well, you like messed up. You no, know, because vibes. you said you're doing Houston and Soda. I'm like I should have just let you. My Let bad. one of us take the L. My, no, no. My bad. Hey, we, we fell for all the dudes coming back on the same day. Jordan and Altuve and Framber trying to turn it around. He didn't. He's in a slump right now. So let's flip it. Money bags, as you can see, we're all up. We're all crushing it on our picks. Even let's, Steven, maybe. 15. Well, yeah, you're 15 I, and 15, but you're up, which there's a whole math to that. We can't so, – we'll get into yeah. it another time, but there's a reason why 
we do it this way so we no can doubt. see that we're, we're often going with plus picks plus money so at bet mgm locks of the day i'll start off Go ahead. i just i got a little mets money line today i think the mets take the dub against the nationals sure. and now there's like less pressure on them you've seen this with the cardinals too <laughs> it's like oh well we're probably not doing anything anymore so now we feel like a little more loose offensively and then for the pitching for me senga's coming off a clunker otherwise he's been great um, I've got him for five plus K's. He's often way above that, but the nationals actually are one of the better contact teams. I still think he gets to five. So I kept it pretty safe at minus minus one fifteen on that one. Kratzy, your turn. I love that. Especially since their highest K rate is against the fork ball against the splitter. So good job tailing that. Now today I got a little bit. Cleveland doesn't strike out a lot. So I'm like, Oh no, what am I going to do? Not a lot of games to choose from, <laughs> but I'm going to go with a little bit of a different for you boys. One walk for Tanner Bybee. He hasn't had one game yet where he hasn't walked at least one batter. So I'm taking my one walk. I'm going six punch outs. And I'm going the Dylan Cease aforementioned not getting traded. He's going to give up three hits today. He hasn't had a start yet this season where he hasn't given up three hits. So... This is a weird lock for me, but it's plus 100, and I'm putting down 300 to win 300. <laughs> nice, nice, cracks. Well, I'm going with, you know, it's been a lot of distractions, you know, Cardinal Clubhouse. Everybody's, they're playing bad. Everybody's worried about getting traded. Um, and the Cubs have been swinging the bat really well lately. So I'm going to go with the Cubs plus 150 uh, to win that game. It's about two. So, yeah, I'm going with the Cubs right here. And I'm, I'm being real simple with it. No runs first inning. Mets, Nationals. I was going to piggyback you, but you kind of kicked it to Eric because you love Eric more than me. But that's okay. I'm at your place this whole week. And hey, you listen, think I love Eric more? Come on. Listen, you're not paying rent, so it's all good. <laughs> Yet. No runs first inning. Mets, Nationals. Keep it simple. Should be a low-scoring game there. I like it, too. You get the, the quick – Quick Rush. hit, and maybe I get something in the third or fourth, too. If exactly. I it yeah, if you win, you keep it hot. Keep it hot, baby. Hey, if you're new to the party on BetMGM on the app, the bonus code to use to join the party with the FT fam is FOUL. Sign up and deposit into the account and download the app on iOS or Android or at BetMGM.com. You can deposit and place your first bet offer. You get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if that first bet loses and it would be available once the wager is settled always bet responsibly gambling problem or concern call 1-800 gambler now we'll take like best one or two questions for slap hands we have about four minutes and also i want to talk judge for a sec before we get to that so let's do that then slap hands will answer your fan questions in here for the trade deadline and i want to remind everyone that we do have uh, a long long time of trade coverage sorry i'm i'm putting some uh we got some bots today taking over taking over in the chat so i'm putting them in time out i'm learning how to do this to to stop the bots uh i'm a youtuber um anyway aaron judge could be back tomorrow we saw the report yesterday from joel sherman that said likely back on friday against the orioles well, it's about damn time. He flew back up from Florida. Like Once he felt like he's like, all right, I can start doing things. They're like, all right, quick to Florida. All right, quick. They're like, take a million at-bats. Okay, quick, come back. They need him back fast. So it could be this weekend, which would be earlier than we thought. Yeah, a lot earlier. And I think that's what's going to happen. His presence is going to be felt. That, that's that's the biggest thing. His presence in the clubhouse, for one, his presence in the box. And just knowing him in the box, I don't care if he's not 100% healthy. But they just got to understand, if, if he wasn't ready to play, they wouldn't let him do it. I, I know the trainers and staff there and what they do. But if they're saying, hey, listen, just go out there, give 70, 60 percent. OK, fine deal. Let's go. And that that's life. People got to understand that. Can't be mad if he's not going to run out of ground ball as hard as he should. Just understand it's Aaron Judge. He's one of the most prolific hitters in the game. His presence is going to bode well for them going forward. Kratzy, your boy's coming back. You think this weekend? You think Friday? Man, I said 11th, so I feel like I'm I'm right on par. We were arguing about it. Uh, <laughs> rehab games, no rehab games. I was off. The guy is ready to go. And I don't know that the running is going to be the issue. And my fear would be, now who do you got to stick out in the outfield? Is, is Big G going to be in the outfield? He could barely score on a double the other day from, from second base. <clears throat> so... I gotta. I, I wonder what this is going to do. 
Is it going to get guys more fastballs? Have they not been getting enough fastballs? Like, I hope it works. I hope it works. Yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, let's slap hands, baby. Um, all right, let me give you this question. I thought this was pretty interesting from Travis. Why don't players sign back with teams that traded them the year before, except for Eraldis Chapman with the Yankees? Perfect question for you guys, right? So if you're with one of your squads, you get dealt, and then they come to you in free agency, and they're like, listen, we weren't contending there. We wanted to get some prospects back. We still love you, baby. Here's some yeah. money. We're going to give you as much as anyone else, if not more. Why not? Why not go back? I'll give you a great example. When I was with the Yankees, um, or I, I wasn't dealt. I take that back. But when I was with him, then free agency comes around. I would have went back to him hundred okay. percent, you know, it just wasn't in the cards. We couldn't get a deal done. I think that's the biggest thing, not coming to getting a deal. Maybe a team gave him better money. I mean, I don't think anybody on this panel would say, oh man, I don't want to go back to a certain team. If they're going to pay you and say, Hey, you're, you're going to be our guy for a couple of years now. Yeah, for sure. Some teams don't want you back. You know, and that's another whole thing in it. It's the business aspect. Everybody understand the business part is the hardest thing because you're looking for a certain amount of money. They're looking for a certain amount. It doesn't come to fruition and another team's willing to pay it. And then you most likely have to go, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'd sign back. Yankees traded me, signed back later. I got to play with the guy that they traded, traded me for. Oh, Rijo, Wendell Rijo. And I got to play in AAA together. Completely different though. <laughs> I was not a big time free agent. Triple <laughs> A, way different. But I did sign back. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm definitely not against signing back with your former team. I mean, I don't know if my situation counts because I got traded, you know, to Kansas City and then seven years later I went back to Milwaukee. So I don't know if that qualifies, even that though it was a seven year difference. But hey, I'm definitely not against it. Obviously. So yeah. Okay, there you go. So <laughs> I, I think uh, from my perspective, just on the front office side of things, it's playing to what Todd father said. Most of the time, I think it doesn't happen because there's 29 other teams. So you're banking on yeah. that team. You're talking about making the best offer, mm -hmm. right? Just what are the chances of that, of the team that, that just traded the guy actually putting the most money up? I think that has to do with it. A lot of the time. Yeah. No the doubt. Yanks brought Chapman back, but guess what? If some other team had a better offer, he gone. Chapman's going to no go doubt. somewhere else. Sure. There, there's like, you guys always say, like you like certain teams better than other teams. And I think anyone's putting a, premium on the A's right now if they're going to sign with the A's you don't even know where you're playing next year yeah. but aside from that I think you look at some of the classic cases John Lester right when he gets traded away from the Red Sox and then doesn't go back like the Cubs gave him a ton of money <laughs> the Red Sox are often not the highest bidder for guys anymore so that was part of it too no Mookie doubt. said he he would have stayed with Boston if Mookie got the free agency and the Red Sox make him the best offer no, he, where's he going he's not going anywhere but Boston he's going to Boston yeah. if they gave him the most money they just didn't the, the Dodgers gave him a better offer so it's less on the player more on the teams yep yep I'm with you oh, all like right that. hit that music baby we got we got work to do Friday just so everyone knows we will be at Borgata in Atlantic City oh give me your Kratz hats I forgot San Francisco Giants we got nice. a little BP, little BP hat. Every time I, every time I uh, break out these hats, I remember that it's not. Uh, this was my, this was my part of the game, BP. <laughs> <laughs> I like the orange. Bring that back for Halloween too. Oh, like a pumpkin with a, my size head. <laughs> By the way, Shohei Otani, one hitter through seven. Mm. I needed Woo. Shohei to get a homer. I, think he's I wanted him to hit a homer yesterday. Hey, Although it's, it's the oh, Tigers. No, but listen. Oh, look at his schedule Scott. coming up. It is the Tiger. The Tiger's been playing well. Stop it. Eh. I'm telling you, look at the Angels' schedule. Look at their next 10 series and tell me how they're going to do. It's real. I'm a schedule person. So, be like, oh, schedule's overrated. No, it's not. Locaine, let's finish with this. Mm -hmm. would, you rather, would you rather your life on the line with your team? you got to win a series. Do you want to play the Nationals or the Braves? <laughs> Come on, man. I'm just saying. People are like, I, I hear it almost every night on the freaking show I watch when they're flying around to games. They're like, schedule doesn't mean anything. You know, the bad teams can play well. Sure, they can, but the percentage chance that they are going to be a more difficult uh, opponent? Right. No thanks. I'll take the Nats. I'll take the Pirates. I'll take the Tigers. I'll take the A's. And Kratzy, you can play the Braves, the Orioles, the Rays. Schedule matters. 
What am I missing here? I, well, I, I, I mean, yeah, you're comparing. I'm right next to you. Help I, me. I, listen, I agree. I agree with you. And I'm not going to say anymore because they're going to jump on my bones. Well, I, I, I will say the Nats. You know, I would like to play the Nats. But one thing I will say. <laughs> of course. I don't like playing teams that are that they don't have anything to play for. Because oh, that's yeah, when you go to right. get beat. I'm afraid of teams that don't have anything to play for. So that's okay, me personally. Then let me just read this. So, And this is going to be funny. Like, they pick up Giolito. They got the Blue Jays this weekend. Okay. Tough. Then they got the Braves. Tough. Then they got the Mariners. Tough. Then the Giants. Boom. Then the Astros. Wow. Then the Rangers. That's Keep all going. on the road, the t- at Rangers and Astros. Good luck. Oh, then they come home. Don't worry. Then they come home. Now we're already deep into August. They got the Rays huh. and the Reds. Huh. Then they go to New York for the Mets. Boom. Then they go to Philadelphia. They might not win one more game. We haven't we haven't hit a bad team. Wait, <laughs> they might not win one wait, game. Wait, I just got through their whole schedule through August. How do you feel? I'm not saying oh, I'm just saying that is a really challenging gauntlet that I just explained there. They are not Was gonna win not? another game. There you go. You want to get a little attention? Five, what if they go five hundred? Are we picking them for the World Series? If they go 500 during that stretch, they're probably not a playoff team because somebody's got to emerge a little better in a pretty good AL wild card race. Trout's you got to go back. better than 500 Trout's during coming that back. stretch. They're picking up a three-time MVP at the trade deadline. He's just getting there a couple couple weeks late. <laughs> I'm fine with it, but okay. Play the music and raise your hand. Oh, we got a tweet? What? Oh, yeah. Oh, John Fisher should be embarrassed about a lot of things, but the Lance Lynn to the Rays rumors. Another reminder, two teams were in stadium limbo. Fisher chose to quit while Sternberg kept his foot on the gas. No excuse for Fisher's behavior. Hmm. Melissa coming in. Coming out hot. hot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Right. I think they're in different spots. And yes, I mean, so we're basically saying one dude is a monster, which we all know. I mean, they're raising ticket prices during their next stadium protest game, and we can get into uh, that another day. Oh, man. Uh, no doubt. That's fine. But all right, back to the Angels for a sec, and we can – we can say goodbye to everyone. Raise your hand. Nice and simple here as we say goodbye. If you think the Angels are making the playoffs this year. Making the playoffs. Just even making it to the playoffs. Raise your hand. Wow. Come on, Lil Kane. Raise your hand. Wow. Can't do trade, it. Trade Shohei Otani. And no, I and love it. Trade Should've both traded of them. Should've traded them. Should've traded them. Nah, I'm pissed too. Trade both of them. Show there we're going to be watching, the, Put them in be watching the Angels the rest of the season. Trade Angels 2024. I'm not happy about it. See you Friday. Big show. Corbin Burns, Kike Hernandez, Writers, Insiders, Trades, Questions, all that.